Committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair reserves the right to declare the committee in recess at any point. But before I begin, I want to uh, remind those in the audience, this hearing is open to the public, but actions that disrupt or distract from the proceedings will not be tolerated. I also want to remind members that if you have to enter or leave the room, please do so through the ante room and not through the doors in the back because the noise is very distracting to our witnesses and members on the dais. Uh, the chair reserves the right to remove disruptive persons from the hearing. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for appearing uh, and for your service to our nation. Over the last two months, we've heard from each of our combatant commanders uh, that the threats we face today are more complex and more formidable than at any point over the last 30 years. Uh, they re each raised grave concerns about how China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are working together to reduce America's global influence, harm our alliances, and undermine our national security. Iran and North Korea are arming Russia with deadly effect in Ukraine. And China's No Limits partnership with Russia is paying off for both countries. Russia is getting critical economic assistance, rocket motors, and microelectronics from China. Putin is using the assistance to keep his economy afloat, and to produce the missiles, aircraft, and other weaponry that is devastating Ukraine. China is getting cheap oil and vital missile technology and enriched uranium from Russia. Z is, use, is using the assistance to help his economy recover and to fuel his breathtaking buildup of space-based and nuclear weapons. China is also buying over a million bears of oil a day from Iran in defiance of Western sanctions. The, Ayat the Ayatollah is using the oil revenues to fund his nuclear ambitions, arm his terrorist proxies, and launch an unprecedented and unjustified direct attack on Israel. Putin, Z, Kim, and the Ayatollah are testing the credibility of American deterrence and the strength of our alliances. After witnessing the president's disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan and his hand-wringing approach, to providing lethal aid to Ukraine, uh, they sense weakness in American resolve. We can't leave them with that impression, and we can't let them continue to get away with their malign actions. We must restore American deterrence, but to do so, we need a budget that will enable that. We need a budget that supports the rapid modernization of our military, a budget that fully funds readiness to ensure we can fight tonight, and a budget that will improve the quality of life of our service members so we can recruit and retain the most, least, most lethal fighting force on the planet. Unfortunately, this budget does not do those things. The 1% increase is pro, uh, is it, it proposes entirely is inadequate. It actually is a 2% cut when you factor in inflation. But this is the hand dealt to us by the Fiscal Responsibility Act that we all have responsibility uh, for enacting. As we move to mark up the FY25 NDA, we will uh, play that hand that was dealt us. But we all need to understand the risk to our national security that this level of investment presents. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about what this budget means for our military readiness, our modernization timeliness, and our efforts to improve service member quality of life. And most importantly, what this budget means for our ability to deter our increasingly undeterred adversaries. With that, I yield to my friend and colleague, the ranking member, for any opening statement he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome our witnesses, Secretary Austin, General Brown, Mr. McCord. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your leadership in, in very, very difficult times. I think the chairman laid it out fairly well. It can be summed up as big threats and a tight budget. Uh, and you have to figure out how to make that work. But as the chairman noted, we have that tight budget because that's what Congress passed and the president signed, so we will have to find a way to live within it. I think the you know, national security strategy lays out those threats quite well. Uh, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and then various transnational terrorist groups, all of which are causing you know, challenges across the world. I 
don't disagree with the chairman's assessment of those challenges or how increasingly uh, the problem is they are working together more and more um, to coordinate those threats in a way that are deeply challenging. We do want to hear today, obviously, about the, the two specific hottest spots right now, what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, it is good that Congress finally passed the aid package to Ukraine. Uh, the months of delay were very costly. I uh, would very, be very interested in your uh, military opinion about where the fight in, in Ukraine goes from here, in Ukraine's ability to hold off the assaults that are coming from Russia. In the Middle East, uh, the war rages on with a continual threat that it could spread. Um, I want to compliment the administration and uh, Secretary Austin in particular, Chairman Brown, for the work to try and contain that, to work with our partners, to work with our allies. Uh, but that challenge continues. And I think it is even more important um, that President Biden continues his push to try to get huma a humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza with the release of the hostages. Um, I know the President has been negotiating that. A number of terms have been put on. The table. Hamas has repeatedly refused to accept that. I, I, I don't think we should stop trying to get to that humanitarian ceasefire going forward and to work to make sure that we get more aid into Gaza. I know that we have begun to uh, build the pier uh, to help get uh, aid in from the sea. Uh, any and all efforts uh, necessary must be put in place, which I, which I very much appreciate. Um, in terms of dealing with the big threats on that tight budget, I want to advance the idea two things. One, we need partnerships and we need diplomacy. Um, we cannot do it alone, and we cannot fight everybody everywhere all at once. We may not like a wide variety of things that these actors that we've talked about are doing. We have to live in the same world that they do, which means we have to talk to China. Yes, at some point, I believe we need to talk to Russia. Um, we need to use our diplomatic skills and our partnerships and alliances, because one of the things I'm really worried about is that Iran, Russia, China, and the others, they're beginning to build partnerships. They're beginning to undermine our economic might. The chairman laid out how they are fighting back against our sanctions by working together. We cannot alienate the entire world and still meet these threats. We need the rest of the world on our side. So I hope we will consider uh, building on the partnerships and diplomacy that we have used. I think the AUKUS agreement is a great example, the Quad that we've used, um, the 54-nation partnership that was pulled together to help um, Ukraine fight off Russia. All those are good examples, but we need to build on that. Lastly, I just want to foot stop what the chairman said about recruitment and retention. Thank him um, and thank the Quality of Life panel, uh, Representative Houlihan, Representative Bacon led, uh, which is focused on making sure that we give our servicemen and women and their families everything they need and give them the support. They are the backbone of our military without any question, and they deserve our support. With that, I look forward to the testimony, and I yield back. Thank you. I thank the ranking member. Uh, our witnesses today are the Honorable Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense, General C.Q. Brown, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Accompanying the Secretary and the Chairman is the Honorable Mike McCord, Under Secretary of Defense. He serves as the DOD's Chief Financial Officer and is available to answer questions. No small job given uh, that he's the Chief Financial Officer of the largest organization on the planet. Uh, with that, uh, we will recognize our fir first witness, uh, Secretary Austin. We'll start with you. Uh, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, uh, distinguished members of the committee, uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify in support of President Biden's proposed fiscal year 2025 budget for the Department of Defense. Pleased to be joined by our outstanding Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General C.Q. Brown, and by Undersecretary Mike McCord, the department's comptroller. Let me start by thanking this committee for all that you do to support the U.S. military, our troops, and our military families. As secretary, I have always been guided by three priorities, defending our nation, taking care of our families, taking care of our people, and succeeding through teamwork. Our budget request for fiscal year 2025 will advance all three of these priorities. First, the President's request will invest in cutting-edge capabilities across all domains. That includes $48.1 billion for naval and shipbuilding capabilities, $62.1 billion to reinforce U.S. air dominance, and $13 billion to bolster Army and Marine Corps combat capabilities. Our request will also provide $33.7 billion to strengthen our space architecture and $14.5 billion to develop and field 
advanced cybersecurity tools. It will direct $49.2 billion to modernize and recapitalize all three legs of our nuclear triad. And it will sharpen our tech edge through a $167.5 billion investment in procurement and $143.2 billion in R&D. Second, this budget will support our outstanding troops and their families. That includes raising base pay and housing allowances, investing in better housing, making child care more affordable, and funding vital work to prevent sexual assault and suicide in the military. And third, this request will help the department further deepen our teamwork worldwide. Our network of allies and partners remains a strategic advantage that no competitor can match. And you can see its power in our strengthening ties across the Indo-Pacific, in today's expanded and united NATO, and in the 50-country Ukraine Defense Contact Group that I convene. Our budget remains rooted in our 2022 National Defense Strategy. Our request positions the United States to tackle the department's pacing challenge, the People's Republic of China, with confidence and urgency. It will help meet the acute threat of Putin's increasingly aggressive Russia. It will help us tackle the persistent dangers from Iran and its proxies. It will help us take on threats from North Korea, global terrorist organizations, and other malign actors. And it will help us continue to deter aggression against the United States and our allies and partners and to prevail in conflict if necessary. Now today, I want to underscore three key messages. First, even as our budget request abides by the mandatory caps set by the Fiscal Responsibility Act, it is aligned to our strategy. We made tough but responsible decisions that prioritize near-term readiness, modernization of the joint force, and support for our troops and their families. Our approach dials back some near-term modernization for programs not set to come online until the 2030s. Second, we can only reach the goals of our strategy with your help. And I'm truly grateful that Congress passed the fiscal year 2024 appropriations in March. And the single way that, the single greatest way that Congress can support the department is to pass predictable, sustained, and timely appropriations. My third and final message is that the price of U.S. leadership is real, but it is far lower than the price of U.S. abdication. As the President has said, we are in a global struggle between democracy and autocracy, and our security relies on American strength of purpose. And that's why our budget request seeks to invest in American security and in America's defense industrial base. The same is true for the recently passed National Security Supplemental that will support our partners in Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, and make key investments uh, to increase submarine production. In fact, about $50 billion of this supplemental will flow through our defense industrial base, creating good jobs, good American jobs, uh, in more than 30 states. So we're grateful for our partners in Congress who help... How help, can you talk help, about U.S. leadership when we're supporting genocide in Gaza? You Committee will come to order. I'd like to formally request those in the audience causing disruption to cease their actions immediately. Security, I'm going to ask you to remove the disruptive persons. It is illegal, it is immoral, it is disgusting. The whole world is watching what we are doing in Gaza right now. Secretary General, you are supporting a genocide. Stop supporting genocide. Apparently, the protesters don't understand we don't have a secretary general in this country. Uh, with that, Mr. Secretary, you're recognized again. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, we, we're grateful for our, uh, for our partners in Congress who help, help us make the investments needed to strengthen America's security uh, through both the supplemental and the president's budget requests. The U.S. military is the most lethal fighting force on Earth. And with your help, we're going to keep it that way. And I deeply appreciate your support for our mission and for our troops. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. General Brown, you're now recognized. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored to join Secretary Austin and the Honorable Law Mike McCord to appear before you today. On behalf of the Joint Force, Department of Defense, civilians, and our families, I want to thank Congress for your steadfast support 
in the opportunity to testify on the fiscal year 2025 defense budget request, which reflects our shared commitment to national security. I also want to thank you for passing the National Security Supplemental, which provides vital support to our allies, partners, and our defense industrial base to counter aggression and strengthen our joint force capabilities and capacity in preparation for any future contingency. The global security environment is increasingly complex. The 2022 National Defense Strategy identifies five key challenges. The People's Republic of China, our pacing challenge, continues its risky behavior around the globe. The newly aggressive Russia with its unprovoked war against Ukraine, the reckless Iran, who, as we saw a few weeks ago, attempts to escalate regional uh, conflict with unprecedented attacks in support of proxy forces. It is stabilizing North Korea, which threatens regional security, and violent extremist organizations with leverage and stability to advance their cause. These challenges are interconnected, which demands a strategic approach addressing the immediate threats while also preparing for future contingencies. It requires all of us to operate with a sense of urgency. Days after becoming the chairman, I laid out three expectations in my message to the Joint Force. Honing our warfighting skills has primacy in all we do, modernizing and aggressively leading with new concepts and approaches, and trust is the foundation of our profession. Our military exists to fight and win our nation's wars. We train every day to ensure we are so good at what we do that we deter any adversary from engaging the U.S. in conflict. This budget requests $147 billion to sustain readiness and ensure the department can counter near-term threats. We are also focused on better integrating our allies and partners in our planning and operations by investing in critical programs and suspend. Gen just we will remain in recess until the disruptive individuals are removed from the chamber. General, you may proceed. Sure. We are uh, all focused on better integrating our allies and partners in our planning and operations by investing in critical programs and capability, expanding security cooperation, exercises, training, and interoperability. Our investments in readiness ensure the joint force can respond when the nation calls. While we are focused on readiness for today, it is critical to modernize and lead with new concepts to prepare for tomorrow. The department continues to invest in capability and capacity to outpace our competitors while transforming from costly legacy platforms that are no longer relevant to the threat. This budget strategically invests $167.5 billion in procurement, underscoring our commitment to equip the Joint Force with unparalleled combat capabilities across every domain. This budget also invests $143.2 billion in research, development, tests, and evaluation of future capabilities that will retain our strategic edge. Finally, this budget invests significantly in nuclear modernization, digital innovation, multi-year procurement of critical munitions, and the strength in defense industrial base. With rapidly evolving threats and technologies, accelerating our modernization is crucial. Lastly, trust is the foundation of our profession. The Joint Force must build upon and uphold the trust in each other. Trust with our families, trust of our elected leaders, and trust of our nation. Enhancing the quality of service and the quality of life of our personnel is not just a moral obligation, it's a strategic imperative. This budget includes investments in quality of service efforts such as advanced training, educational uh, benefits, and career development, while also investing in quality of life projects like housing, medical clinics, and child care facilities, as well as funding spouse employment initiatives, enhanced mental health resources, and robust, robust programs to combat sexual assault. We must create an environment where all can reach their full potential. Trust that our joint force stands ready, ready to defend our national interest, ready to deter aggression, and ready, if necessary, to fight and win our nation's wars. I thank you for your support and collaboration and our shared commitment to face the security challenges of today and prepare for tomorrow. We are living in consequential times, and there's no time to waste. Thank you, and look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. I recognize myself for uh, opening questions. Uh, you've, General, I addressed this first question to you. You talked about what the budget would do. Uh, as we know, we've talked about this is a tight budget. 
Uh, tell me what we can't do with this budget. Tell me about some of the trade-offs that you've had to make uh, as a result of this 1% increase. Well, Chairman, I appreciate the question. As the Secretary highlighted in his, his opening uh, uh, remarks, what we had to do is uh, we focused on readiness for the near term. And it, uh, as we uh, did that, there's some areas that we did not, uh, we elected not to modernize some capabilities that would deliver in, uh, later, later into the 30s. And so that's where, uh, uh, where we had to uh, address some of the uh, shortfalls in this particular budget uh, by making those, uh, those choices to focus for example, on race. For example, give me an example of something that you, did, that you deferred. Uh, I'd have to get you more, uh, more detail, uh, Chairman, but uh, you know, as we look at uh, various capabilities, and I would say, say uh, munitions is a key one of those uh, uh, that we've uh, focused on, as well as as we look at our shipbuilding, uh, our, our uh, sub-industrial uh, uh, base as well, um, and uh, air, you know, um, air, aircraft. Uh, how, is this, how is this budget going to affect your training? Do you have a, an idea about that? Well, not, not much, because we actually did focus on our readiness, and, and that's why the $147 billion is to focus on our, our readiness. Um, you know, we are a very uh, uh, capable uh, joint force, and uh, using the capabilities we do have today while we you know, uh, pursue feature modernization is where we, our focus is on uh, readiness today, uh, Chairman. Okay, I would ask this to both of you. Uh, I know you've got to be concerned about this growing cooperation that we're seeing between uh, Russia, China, Iran and North Korea. Uh, do you feel like that this budget adequately resources our ability to deter their organized and unified aggressive behavior in the coming years, Mr. Secretary? Uh, thanks, Chairman. Um, the, the growing nexus between uh, the PRC, Russia, uh, and, uh, and the DPRK and Iran is, uh, is concerning. And this is something that we uh, are watching very closely. Um, you know, as we look at what Russia is doing, uh, because of the, the, the damage that uh, Ukraine inflicted on Russia's land forces, Russia turned then to uh, DPRK for additional munitions and, uh, and, and, and t in the form of artillery munitions and, and missiles. Um, Iran has provide, is providing uh, Russia with drone uh, capability, technology and actual drones themselves. And that's made a difference in Russia's ability to, uh, to recover from, uh, from what, you know, the damage that, the Ukraine, that Ukraine has inflicted on them. Uh, and then North Korea, again, uh, it's becoming more confident because of its, uh, its uh, affiliation with, uh, with Putin. Uh, so this is very concerning. Something that we're going to have to watch, something that, that we're going to have to make sure that we have the capability and capacity uh, to work with our allies to, uh, to uh, continue to deter and, and, and continue to promote uh, peace and stability uh, in each of the regions. But to your point, very concerning uh, and something that, uh, uh, that we're going to have to stay on top of going forward. So. General Brown. I, I would echo uh, the Secretary's comments about being very concerning and, and watching how uh, uh, these uh, countries are uh, working and somewhat interconnected. Uh, by the same token, what I have seen in the seven months, tomorrow will be seven months I've been in the job. Um, I've engaged uh, about 170 times with uh, counterparts, my counterparts from around the world. And uh, what I've found is as the world has gotten more complex, um, our, the work with our allies and partners has strengthened. Uh, we watch how NATO is uh, as strengthened, NATO is, is larger, but as I engage with uh, you know, nations in Europe, they're focused on the Indo-Pacific, and the Indo-Pacific nations are also focused on Europe because all these are uh, uh, it's a global uh, uh, threat to all of us. And, uh, you know, that dialogue is uh, definitely increased, and I've seen that happen um, in the jobs I've held as a senior leader. When you talk to your counterparts uh, around the world, what resources would they like to see us bring uh, to the table as a part of that effort to combat or deter the behavior you just described? Well, what I, what I would highlight is uh, um, they're concerned about uh, our collective defense industrial base and bringing capability. You know, one thing I do find as I engage around the world is that U.S. capability, U.S. equipment is highly desired. And uh, we've got to be able to uh, provide that capability and equipment. And uh, th those are the things that they are uh, keenly interested in. They're also interested in our ability to inter uh, uh, work and be able to interoperate, even when they have their own defense industrial base that they're also trying to increase as well. Um, and so it's how we work together and to break down barriers um, to be able to work uh, across our industries, across our services, or across our governments uh, will be important. 
Thank you, General. I yield to the ranking member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, a ton of topics we could cover. I just want to ask one, one question, and that is on recruitment and retention. I know, Secretary Austin, this has been a particular focus of yours for some time. Uh, can you update us on how we're doing? Obviously, the pandemic was a huge challenge coming out of that. There have been other challenges. Where are we at, uh, in your opinion, on being able to recruit and retain uh, the service members we need? Um, you're right, sir. I, um, COVID, uh, really caused us a significant problem in our inability to get into high schools and, and uh, work the, uh, the areas that uh, we typically work uh, for, for recruiting. Um, Post-COVID, uh, we have been able to, uh, uh, to reverse those trends, get back into the high schools, to, to, to advertise in, uh, in the right markets, to reestablish contacts with centers of influence. Um, each of the services has made a concerted effort to hire the right kinds of recruiters and put the right kinds of recruiters, uh, you know, out there to to represent uh, the services, and that's that's proving uh, to be very very helpful. Uh, as we look at where we are right now, we see the curves beginning to bend, uh, and uh, in in favor of uh, of you know more product more productivity. Uh, I expect that uh, Army. Air Force, Space Force, and the Marines will all um, make mission uh, this year, just based upon their forecasts. Uh, and I attribute that to their, their hard work. I mean, they've been, uh, they've been doing a lot to, uh, to reverse these trends. Uh, and, and you know, it's, uh, this is the tightest job market that, uh, that we've seen in a very, very long time. So uh, there's, uh, uh, there's, there are plenty of jobs for people to, uh, 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 to, to have or to get, and so this has been very competitive. But I think the services are doing the right thing. And, uh, and again, I have to uh, attribute this to their hard work and their focus. The senior leaders are focused on this in a major way, and I talk to them about, about this routinely. On top of that, retention is uh, the highest that it's, that it's been uh, uh, in a very, very long time. And so when troops uh, join us, they want to stay with us. And a good part of that is because of what you continue to do to help us, help resource us to uh, provide for, for them and their families. So. Thank you, uh, General Brown. You have... well, thank you. As uh, the Secretary highlight, uh, we, we do see a positive trend. And uh, since I've been the, uh, not only as a service chief watching this and uh, coming through COVID and watching the numbers change, but also as a chairman, I've had a chance to sit down and uh, meet with uh, uh, recruiters from all of our services. I've gone to one of our processing centers to take a look and ask questions about uh, the things we can do um, to increase the, uh, the throughput uh, of our, uh, through our recruiting stations. At the same time, it's how we engage. And one of the things when I talk about trust, it's how we um, that have served, uh, what inspired us to join and how we inspire the next generation and how we engage and show all the opportunities um, that are, uh, are available uh, by serving in our, uh, in our force or serving uh, the nation at large. And so uh, we, we do see uh, some positive trends. And I would also say the same thing with retention. The, the numbers, we're, we're meeting uh, all of our retention, um, and we're doing very well there. Uh, but we got to continue. We can't rest on laurels, and, and that's why the support of uh, this committee and the Congress, uh, particularly as you look at the quality of life, uh, uh, does play a role um, because it plays a role not just for the member, but it plays a role for their family as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for being here in your service on behalf of our country. And to me, it's so clear that the primary function of the national government is to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and that's national defense. And so your service is more important than ever. And uh, putting that in the context, too, uh, what we're talking about is deterrence of peace through strength. And so uh, what you're doing uh, could not be more important. And I particularly appreciate military service. My, uh, I have four sons who have served in Egypt, Afghanistan, uh, and uh, Iraq. Uh, my Navy son, uh, uh, the benefit of military service uh, is so exciting. My uh, son served as a Navy doctor in Naples. I now have three grandchildren who speak perfectly Italian. Uh, so I look at military service as uh, opportunity uh, to serve, but opportunity for fulfilling, fulfilling and meaningful life. And so what you're doing, and I'm so happy to hear about retention, being good, uh, Mr. Secretary, that's great. Uh, putting that in perspective, too, uh, I, your service today is more important than ever. Uh, it's been referred to uh, and bipartisan uh, with the uh, terminology uh, by uh, uh, Ranking Member Smith of uh, partnerships among 
uh, adversaries. Um, the leadership that we have uh, with Chairman Mike Rogers, who stood up uh, against the dictators, and then your reference to authoritarians or autocrats against democracy. I like to phrase it as dictators with rule of gun who are uh, invading democracies with rule of law. This is not a war that we chose. This is a war that war criminal Putin chose on February 24, 2022, when he invaded Ukraine and conducted mass, mass murder. Uh, this is another uh, indication with the uh, invasion by Iran with its puppets of Hamas of Israel on October 7. And we need to do all we can to deter uh, the Chinese Communist Party from an invasion of the uh, terrific country of Taiwan. With all of this in mind, uh, over and over again, um, we should be uh, grateful. And I uh, am very happy, General Brown, that this week it's reported that finally that uh, long-range attackers have been provided to the people of Ukraine to defend their country, uh, provided by Germany, the United Kingdom, and now the U.S. Additionally, I hope that cluster bombs are provided as quickly as possible. I, we have excess that need to be destroyed. I know a way to destroy them, and that is to send them to the people of Ukraine. It's been reported that war criminal Putin is jamming various precision munitions, causing lower accuracy rates for targeting than advertised. And it's very important that we uh, equip Ukraine with the latest technology. With F-16s being provided to Ukraine by the Netherlands and Denmark, will the department be considering to have joint air to service uh, standoff missiles to be more advanced precision fires of the F-16s in the delivery package to Ukraine? General Brown. Well, as we uh, bring on the F-16s, uh, it's the, uh, uh, not only the airplanes, but it, uh, it's, it's uh, the uh, training of the uh, pilots, also training of the maintenance, but also bring sure we have the uh, weapon system to go with it. And that's part of the, uh, the conversation we're having with the countries that are not only contributing uh, F-16s, but as part of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, there is an Air Force uh, coalition that the United States is part of, and that is the dialogue that uh, we're having to uh, not only uh, just get to the airplanes, but also get it to a full capability. And uh, a, a good news, uh, Secretary Austin, in December, Japan announced it's transferring Patriot interceptors back to the U.S. to replenish our stockpiles. Earlier this month, there was a joint statement with Japan. The administration wants to pursue co-development and co-production of missiles for forward deployed in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this is great for the Indo-Pacific. It really follows, um, indeed, NATO coming together with now with uh, Sweden and uh, Finland. Uh, the uh, assistance uh, by the EU, of all people, uh, for the people of Ukraine, uh, for Europe, but with the Indo-Pacific, are there other examples of defense cooperation agreements that can be pursued to deter the dictators who seek to destroy Western civilization? Well, thanks, sir. As you know, uh, we have uh, done a lot of work to strengthen our relationship with the ROK. Uh, we have uh, promoted a uh, trilateral uh, relationship between the ROK, Japan, and us. You, uh, as you witnessed uh, months, months ago, the President held a summit here in the United States uh, with those, the leadership of those three countries. Uh, we've uh, strengthened our relationship with, with uh, the Philippines. And so now we're, we, we have the ability to operate uh, uh, alongside the, the Filipinos uh, in more sites in, in the Philippines. Uh, and three years ago, uh, the leadership uh, was, uh, was going to disinvite us uh, and, and not allow us to operate in the Philippines. But that my, Hey, Mr. Secretary, my time is up. But again, it's exciting to see countries come together that, that we have not before, uh, from the Philippines to uh, Sweden and Finland. Chairman, Thank you very much. Chairman, time expired. Chairman, I recognize Jim from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to both uh, witnesses for your diligent service and your uh, testimony today. Mr. Secretary, one of the smartest actions which Congress and your department made was last year was enacting AUKUS authorities. I want to particularly compliment your legislative team who worked with a number of us on the committee to successfully steer a very complex package into last year's NDAA. As you laid out on page 16 of your testimony, it's not just an aspirational plan. AUKUS is moving out fast on many fronts. For example, I had the pleasure to welcome the first three Aussie Naval officers to sub-school at the Groton Sub Base in Connecticut, where they learned proficiency in the operation of nuclear-powered submarines, a key AUKUS Pillar 1 goal. All three, by the way, graduated in the top five of their class, and another 100 of their colleagues are going to be following in their footsteps. 
Mr. Secretary, having been on this committee for quite a while, it was quite striking to me the amount of focus in your statement on the need to grow and strengthen our nation's defense industrial base. On page 20 of your written testimony, you highlighted the department's publication last January, the National Defense Industrial Strategy, which was the first for the department to its credit. And that report honestly laid out warts and all, all the painful history of neglect of that base, which goes back decades, and acknowledged particularly the damage that procurement instability from the Pentagon has done. Coming Coming from a district with a submarine shipyard that was decimated by such instability from 1990 to 2010, I could not agree more. Over the past 13 years, however, Congress has led the way to stabilize that yard and other yards and, and their supply chains with steady two Virginia submarine per year pro procurement, and the workforce has rebounded from a low of 9,000 to 23,000 today. COVID's pandemic did slow down production, and it's undeniable that the recovering pace needs to continue to pick up. But I would note that contra contrary to the narrative coming out of the department, starting last fall of 2023, four submarines have been or will be s delivered to the Navy by the end of 2024. USS Rickover, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Iowa, and Idaho and Arkansas are slated to be delivered in 2025. The supply chain has rebounded as well with Congress's SIB investments going back to 2018. Those investments need to continue, but so does procurement stability. Unfortunately, the 2025 budget plan has injected unexpected new instability by cutting a sub, a direct deviation from last year's fit up in the Navy's shipbuilding plan. And I would argue is also contradicts the National Defense Industrial Strategy's warning about the need to maintain procurement stability. As the Wall Street Journal powerfully noted, U.S. submarine technology is a crown jewel of America's military power and a true advantage over a rapidly expanding Chinese naval fleet. Buying only one boat is a terrible signal for capital investment, and it tells adversaries that the U.S. is not serious about rearming. I don't totally buy that last comment. But I would say that having been home since the budget came out, I've talked to supply chain companies who are hitting the pause button on planned investments. This has a real ripple effect when that signal shows instability. One of the provisions of the AUKUS authorities was uh, in the NDAA, Section 1352, is, is something that I think is really at the center of what we did last year, which is that it authorized the President of the United States to certify the sale of three Virginia-class submarines starting in 2032, 2035, and 2038. That President has to certify, when that, when that time comes, that those sales are not going to degrade our own fleet. Nobody in this room knows who, the next, who that President will be after the 2028 election. But to me, I want to make sure that that decision is as easy as possible to make sure that the goal of AUKUS is going to be achieved. Cutting a sub from the inventory, which is what this budget proposal unfortunately does, in my opinion, makes that decision harder. We're going to work hard on this committee, and my colleagues are already you know, hard at work in terms of getting requests over to the Appropriations Committee. We did it in 2007. We did it in 2013 under the Obama administration. We did it in 2020 under the Trump administration. Uh, again, I think it is so important for the, the goal of AUKUS, which again, I think is one of, gonna be one of your hallmark achievements, that we maintain procurement and we, as I said, you know, make that decision uh, in the early 2030s as early as possible. I don't have a question for you today, but uh, again, I'll, with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Turner. Mr. Chair, I'll send General Brown um, and uh, Mr. McCord, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, Secretary Austin, I, I know you are aware that last week um, our ambassador to the United States, to the United Nations, um, in conjunction with the Japanese, uh, brought forth a resolution to the UN Security Council uh, asking for um, all nations to prevent a dangerous nuclear arm race in outer space uh, and to um, uh, calling for a prevention of a nuclear arms race in space. This resolution was blocked, uh, vetoed by Russia and abstained by China. Um, Secretary Austin, um, what would be the effect if a nuclear device was detonated today in outer space? It would be, it would have uh, devastating uh, consequences uh, on a lot of our uh, 
uh, capabilities uh, uh, in space, not only our capabilities, but the capabilities of, uh, of other countries. Uh, and, and so uh, for that reason, we think it's irresponsible for anybody to even consider uh, deploying or imp and employing a nuclear device uh, in space. Well, Mr. Secretary, um, General Michael Trout of the commander of Germany's Military Space Command agrees with you. He stated the worst case scenario of an indiscriminate nuclear blast, blast in space radiating, radiating out at a satellite frying electromagnetic pulse across low Earth orbit would be devastating, as you had said, for everyone. If somebody dares to explode a nuclear weapon in high atmosphere or even space, this would be more or less the end of the usability of that global commons of orbit. Deploying a nuclear weapon in space would also be counter to the United Nations Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Um, in addition, it would have catastrophic effects on civilian uh, use of space and our commercial use of, of space. Uh, Mr. Secretary, why would someone put a satellite in space that has nuclear capabilities to detonate a weapon in space as opposed to just use a missile or an ICBM to detonate a nuclear weapon in space? Certainly uh, a device like that would have, uh, could have uh, a much more extensive impact and, co and cover more, uh, more uh, ground, for lack of a better term, uh, with one device uh, than a uh, an anti-satellite anti uh, uh, weapon, which is you know, directed towards a specific uh, target. Now, this thing would, uh, would take away large swaths of capability. Uh, and, and as you pointed out, not just uh, our capability, but, uh, but also allies and partners. And, uh, and, and, and so um, we don't really fully know or understand what, uh, what the full effects would be. It would, it would depend upon, you know, the yield of the weapon, uh, the orbit that it was in, and, and all those things. But, uh, but certainly it would Mr. have... Mr. Secretary, uh, it wouldn't one of the reasons why they'd put it in space as opposed to shoot an ICBM or missile is because um, an ICBM or missile could be attributed as a nuclear weapons attack on a country and would have a, a, res a nuclear weapons response? That, that's right. If it was a, uh, a an attack on on one of our terrestrial uh, capabilities, uh, sure. But it, there's also they also have the opportunity or the ability to use a, a ground launch capability to attack a satellite and take out uh, some uh, capability that's on orbit. Mr. Secretary, uh, John Plum, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy, told reporters on um, April fifth that Washington was in discussions with Russia about the weapons plans and apparent confirmation that Moscow is at least engaging on the topic. Um, is, is Russia developing an, an anti-satellite weapon with nuclear capabilities? Um, and certainly, I, I uh, would not want to get into a discussion of uh, intelligence uh, uh, information in an open hearing, but certainly we can, we can have that discussion. Uh, right. So, Mr. Secretary, the reason why I ask you the question and the reason why you're stumbling is because the Biden administration refused to declassify this information. So we're not able to have an open public discussion. But one thing I'm concerned about is that, Mr. Secretary, in your entire um, a written testimony, you never mention anti-satellites as a threat. You certainly don't even mention nuclear weapons as a threat, but the administration's moving forward trying to get the UN Security Council to take action. I believe that this is a, the Cuban Missile Crisis in space, and this administration is sleepwalking itself into an international crisis. And I certainly want to encourage you to encourage the administration to declassify this and take every actions necessary to avoid this space race uh, that could, as the, our ambassador to the United Nations says, be a nuclear weapons space race. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair, now recognizes a gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, thank you. I'd, my colleague from Connecticut talked about cutting a sub. Uh, we make choices here, as you do at the Department of Defense also. Uh, Mr. Secretary, on December 9th, 2022, you gave a speech where you said, Nuclear deterrence isn't just a numbers game, and, th and that thinking can spur an arms race. You stress the importance of working to reduce the global role of nuclear weapons, which we just heard from our colleague, and I happen to agree. For years, I've questioned the viability and the premise of the Sentinel program. In December, the Department of Defense announced 
that the ever-escalating cost of the Sentinel program, now estimated that at least $137 billion, had breached the critical non recurring limit, and that by law, the program must be terminated unless you, Mr. Secretary, certify that the program is, one, essential to national security, two, that there are no alternatives to the program, three, that the new cost estimates are reasonable, and four, that the program is a higher priority than programs whose funding must be reduced. Am I correct in saying that you are aware of your task that lies ahead? I am, sir. I'm pleased to hear that, because even without the required analysis by law that the Sentinel program, far too many Pentagon leaders have said, and I quote, the Sentinel will be funded, we'll make the trades. Mr. Secretary, can you assure us that you will require that a truly fulsome and critical analysis of the Sentinel program will be made and that the alternatives, for example, a submarine, will not be funded so that the Sentinel program can go ahead? I, I can assure you that uh, we will um, conduct a thorough analysis uh, in accordance with the uh, Nunn-McCurdy uh, Act responsibilities and the responsibilities that you've outlined uh, uh, um, as well. So. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I believe you have until sometime in July to make that decision, and along the course in early May or late May, you will, General Brown, provide to the committees the analysis required by law. Is that correct? We will. We'll, we'll support the timeline to, to uh, enable the Secretary to uh, uh, make his uh, determination. Uh, in your opening remarks, General Brown, you said that, quote, our investment in nuclear capabilities reflects a judicious balance between advancing cutting-edge technologies and phasing out legacy capabilities. Fourth grade math would indicate that at $700 million a copy, $137 billion can buy you somewhere more than 120 B-21 bombers complete with an ISRO. Or perhaps seven Columbia-class submarines for $137 billion choices to be made here. Is an attack submarine important? Is an additional 120 or so B-21 bombers, complete with an LSRO, important? More important than a Sentinel? Can the Minuteman III be life extended? And by the way, committee members, why do we consistently write into the NDAA that there must be 400 ICBMs? There's been no analysis to indicate that. And has the Joint Requirements Office Oversight Council actually revisited the military requirements necessary for the nuclear enterprise? Has that been done, General Brown? That is part of their task is to continue, not just on the nuclear portfolio, but uh, across all of our portfolios for um, our joint warfighters. I await that analysis. I yield back. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Austin, your written testimony says that the fiscal year 25 budget invests in air and missile defense systems, which will, quote, preserve our ability to deploy combat credible forces when needed, unquote. However, the Missile Defense Agency's budget you delivered to Congress was almost $1 billion below fiscal year 24 budget projections. It canceled, cut, or delayed several munitions programs. 
In fact, the day after I protested these cuts recently to the director of the Missile Defense Agency, Iran la launched a direct and massive attack on Israel that included over 100 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles, and 150 attack drones. Yet we have limited stocks and we have allies and friends who are desperate for us to give them some of our limited stocks. So why did the department choose these drastic cuts to missile defense at a time when we need it more than ever to protect our homeland and our allies and partners? Well, thank you, sir. As, we stated, as I stated earlier, uh, because of the FRA, uh, we did have to make uh, some choices, and they were always tough choices. Uh, and we recognize that, uh, that, that uh, we needed to invest in uh, current, uh, current readiness, and we put a $147 billion request on the table to do that. Uh, and uh, going forward, uh, we will uh, invest in those things that we weren't able to invest in in this budget uh, if we get support for an increased top line in the out years. Okay, uh, the chairman asked you both specifically to give an example of something that's been deferred, and I've got one here I'd like to refer to. The budget you've submitted also delays the glide phase interceptor. This would be a defense against hypersonic weapons until after 2035. That's uh, 11 years from now. And yet they have this capability today, Russia and China both, especially China. So how is this meeting the threat of hypersonics when we have this threat staring at us today to, to put it off till 2035? Yeah, again, for those... Uh capabilities that uh, those investments that, that wouldn't deliver capabilities until after 2030 uh, for this current uh, budget, we decided to, uh, to not invest in that, but uh, invest in that in later years. So. Well, um, thank you for clarifying that, but I'm thinking we need to re-examine. Sure, there, sure, there's a lot of priorities here, but this is one we've got to re-examine. Um, also, changing gears to nuclear deterrence, when the Biden administration came into office, one of its first acts was to offer an unconditional five-year extension on the New START Treaty. I believe this was a short-sighted gift to Vladimir Putin. According to the State Department, Russia is now in its second consecutive year of violating the New START Treaty. And last year, the Strategic Posture Commission, a bipartisan a uh, committee composed of great experts published its report that described the current nuclear modernization program of record as being necessary but insufficient given China's breathtaking increase in nuclear capability. Uh, General Brown, I'll ask you this one. So neither Russia or China are appearing at all interested in coming to the negotiating table and yet we now have the growth of a third nuclear superpower in, the, in this world. So a new tr START treaty is probably going to expire in three years without being renewed by the Russia and the U.S. What should we be doing to prepare for that eventuality? Right, thanks for the question. And, and what I would say is uh, what we need to do is not only thinking about the treaty, and I realize that will be a policymakers, but from my perspective as a, uh, as a chairman, as a warfighter, is making sure we are getting capability um, in, in our nuclear portfolio, but also a conventional uh, portfolio. I sat down with the Strategic Posture uh, Commission. We talked not only about our nuclear portfolio, but also our conventional capabilities as well. And what's really important to be able to do that is to uh, have uh, consistent funding, uh, consistent demand signal, um, to uh, provide uh, that, that capability as we work with our defense industrial base. And those are the things uh, we'll, we'll need to do. As the Secretary highlight, we'll, we're right now we're focused on readiness based on the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Uh, but as we look uh, to the out years, we do need to focus on not only uh, get, you know, identifying the capability, but giving it consistent funding and then be able to accelerate that capability into the hands of our, our warfighters. Okay, well, well, thank you both. Uh, we are addressing some of the immediate needs right now, I believe, in a good way but we really need to look at these out years for what's going to be coming down uh, later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chairman, I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Norcross. Thank you, Chairman, and to the witnesses for being here today and certainly for your service to our nation. Uh, in your opening remarks, and quite often prior to this, uh, we've talked about the American defense industrial base. And certainly coming out of the pandemic and since then with the wars raging, uh, primarily in Ukraine, we've seen 
the imbalance that we are having in the industrial base, that we have those risks in the supply production and the delivery. Uh, and certainly you have started and we must have a, what I would call more aggressive uh, posture in order to build that up. Uh, because not only does it need to be resilient and reliable, it also needs to be affordable. And certainly starting from behind the finish line, uh, building that up in a quick way is usually not the most efficient. So to date, and this would go to you, Secretary Austin, is what has the department done from where we started a few years ago on this quick uh, and immediate need to build up, in particular, our munition space. Could you elaborate on some of the steps we've taken? Yeah, in, in order to maintain our competitive edge, we're, we're going to have to continue to invest uh, in, in munitions, uh, and, um, and, and we, we're doing that. We've done that uh, with your help. As you know, for, the, for 24, we asked you for uh, a number of uh, multi-year procurement authorities, uh, and you supported us with that request. Uh, and uh, over the last three years or so, we've invested uh, north of $75 billion uh, in munitions, uh, which, uh, uh, and it's, uh, I might add, in a supplemental that, uh, that you just uh, approved for us, uh, there, there are resources in that supplemental that help uh, that we, that we apply to the uh, industrial base and help them expand to increase their capacity so to meet the current demand and the demand in the future. Uh, so I want to thank you, thank all the members for that. Uh, but we, we put a lot of work into uh, working with industry leaders to, you know, to uh, increase, uh, increase capacity, increase capability, and, and again, with your help, uh, that's, uh, that's been very effective. Now, we also need to work with allies and partners uh, to increase international uh, capacity as well. And my, uh, uh, my Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment uh, is leading the charge to work with other, other countries uh, to, uh, to promote uh, them expanding their industrial base as well. Even after everything is all said and done, as you know, we're going to have to make sure we're producing enough capability uh, to help allies and partners who've dug deep uh, in support of Ukraine and, and, and other things, help them replenish their stocks after we've replenished our stocks as well. So. Well, I certainly appreciate that. And sending the right signals to industry so that they are prepared is incredibly important. And that leads me to the next question. The assessment and how we're going to manage at some point, hopefully sooner than later, that we are going to build not only our stocks up to the tune of $50 billion under the aid package, but to help our allies and partners. How are we going to send the correct signals to industry that when we meet that, it's just not going to drop off? Uh, Mr. Courtney talked about the submarine base of years ago and what happened that when we abruptly stopped. How are we going to manage our munitions base that we're building up now, but when we backfill, how are we going to handle that? Well, it's some, some, uh, certainly something that uh, that we are focused on, and, and we will continue to work with with industry on. Um, there's certainly when the when the demand uh, shrinks a bit, uh, we have to be cognizant of the fact that we have to have a capability to rapidly expand uh, if required. Now, there, the way that we produce uh, munitions, the way that, the way that we uh, design production lines, all of those things have to be taken into account. Maybe there are things that we can compress uh, uh, so that we can rapidly expand when called upon to do that. But those are things that, uh, that we're taking a hard look at. And, uh, um, and industry uh, has been very supportive uh, uh, thus far, and we, I expect that they'll be supportive going forward. We've got to send the right signal to them to, your, to the point that you're making. Certainly. Uh and we also have to look at the reserve munitions that we've had in the past and say, is that ad adequate given the way that Ukraine and other areas of the world have really operated in the last six months to two years? Uh, certainly th that is incredibly important, and I yield back. I thank the you. gentleman. Chair, now recognize the gentleman for Virginia, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us today. Thanks so much for your service to our nation. General Brown, I, I want to discuss the cost and exchange ratios between 
our weapons and weapons of our adversaries. You know, I've talked all the time about the way we win this competition is we have to get more per our dollar than the Chinese get per their yuan or the Russians get per their ruble. And unfortunately today, that's not the case. I know you've supported CCAs and, and, and that sort of uh, accumulation of mass where we can do quickly. I think that is absolutely where we need to be. I want to talk a little bit about the unit costs of where we are today. The unit cost for an SM-6 missile is $4 million. The unit cost for a Shahid-136, the kamikaze-style drone that is being used by Iran against Israel, being used by the Russians against Ukraine, is $50,000 a copy. I'm not a mathematician, but this is not sustainable. I want to show the other slide, too, where we talk about the annual production for SM-6 missiles. In the United States, we build 125 SM-6 missiles a year. If you look at the production of the Shahid-136, 6,000 a year. I'm not a mathematician, but this math just doesn't add up. There's no way that we can counter, both in mass and in cost, what we're seeing from our adversaries. And this is in many other areas around the world, and we've seen this, this developing capability. I want to make sure that we're doing more to do the right thing to counter these threats. I want to know, why does, why does the Joint Staff, using the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, continue to support exquisite requirements in the face of these expendable platforms that our adversaries are using? Listen, we're going to go Winchester really fast, not just on ammunition, but also on money. Tell me, tell me, how are we getting to a point of where we are able to counter these Class Three UAVs with mass and affordability? Well, I appreciate your question because I'm in the uh, same spots you are. And that's why I often talk about the, uh, we have to have capability and capacity. It's one thing to have high-end capability but limited capacity or low-end capability with a lot of capacity. And we've got to be able to balance across that. And so uh, the examples you used on the, for the SM6, uh, particularly in, in you look at the events that happened on the, on the 13th of this month, uh, we used a, a combination of capabilities to include air-to-air -air missiles, AIM-9Xs uh, AIM and AIM-120s. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we got to have a range of capabilities yeah. in, in addition to non-kinetic capability, directed energy. Uh, and so that's where my focus is as the chairman. And uh, I, I am very much focused with the JROC that, to change that perspective to ensure that we are not just focused on this high-end capability, but we focus on a range of capabilities to ensure we have uh, uh, all, uh, many opportunities and options um, that are uh, cost effective against the, uh, the threat. Very good. Thank you. Secretary Austin, President Biden has said in the past that we will defend Taiwan if they are attacked by China. In your estimation, do we have the capability and capacity today to adequately equip our forces to pursue this mission of defending Taiwan? Our, our, uh, our military is the most powerful military on the planet, uh, and not only do, uh, do we have more capability than anyone else, we, in, in terms of the ability to, uh, to use uh, what we have on hand and to integrate uh, fires and to, and to maneuver responsibly uh, and effectively, we also work with allies and partners and increase their capability as well. You've seen us do that pretty effectively uh, in the, in the Indo-Pacific thus far. And we continue to build upon that. Now, AUKUS was mentioned earlier. This is a, a, uh, an incredible capability that's, uh, that's a, a game changer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it will certainly add to, uh, to the overall uh, deterrence in the, in the theater. Uh, but there are a number of examples like that throughout. So. Let, me, let me drill down a little bit further. When we look at what we're going to face in that theater, we're going to be operating in a highly contested environment, which means we have to be able to reach Chinese assets at long range in order to degrade that environment to a contested environment where we have a much, much better advantage. Tell me, where are we with magazine depth and capability and capacity currently with long range precision strike weaponry in that theater? Well, we, we uh, again, I think when you look at, uh, at our capability, I think we're, we're in a pretty good place. We never have uh, everything that we want, but certainly it's, it's the mix of capabilities that's, that's important here. Uh, and, uh, and that's our goal, to make sure that we have the right mix of capabilities to, to ensure that we can be effective. The gentleman's time has expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Kana. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the witnesses for your service to our nation. 
President Sisi of Egypt has said that an invasion of Rafah would have catastrophic consequences, both for the humanitarian situation and for broader regional peace and security. President Abbas has said, quote, it would be the biggest catastrophe in the Palestinian people's history. And yet this morning I read that Prime Minister Netanyahu is saying, with or without a hostage deal, he plans to go in to Rafah. Mr. Secretary, we're the greatest nation in the world. We're the most powerful nation in the world. This is not a time for vague ambiguities. Will you please commit today and send a clear message to Mr. Netanyahu that he should not go in to Rafa? What we have uh, emphasized uh, throughout uh, is that we, th they must do um, what's necessary to protect the civilians in, in the battle space. Uh, a much better job of what we've seen thus far. And as you know, there are uh, north of a million uh, civilians that have moved into that space that if, they're, if you're going to conduct operations, then, then those civilians must be accounted for and hopefully moved out of, moved out of the area. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, we, if, if they were going to conduct uh, operations, we want to see a different approach uh, to those operations as well. Uh, but uh, thus far, we've not seen uh, the civilians moved out of the battle space. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, what they have said is that uh, their operations will be sequential, where they uh, account, and account for the civilians and move the civilians uh, out of harm's way uh, before they would... Uh, Let me ask you this, Mr. Secretary. Is there, would you oppose it if you don't see a plan? If tomorrow he goes in without a plan, would you oppose that? Of course I would. Yeah. And would there be consequences in that case if Netanyahu goes in without a plan? Uh, the consequences, of course, that, that would be determined by the president. Would it be on the table to stop offensive weapons if he did that? Again, those, that's determined by the president. So. What would be your military advice if I, he did that? I'll never share my military advice uh, that I give to the president with, uh, with anyone. So. Let me ask this, though. You would, you would certainly oppose it without a plan. Do you, in your years, and I, you know how much respect I have for you and your service, do you really believe that there is a conceivable plan of evacuation that would save civilian lives and allow Netanyahu to go into Rafah? Could you come up with such a plan? I, I could, and, and, uh, but it, it takes time. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, we, we see some signs that, uh, that, that, that they are moving towards that direction. Uh, but in terms of uh, all of the things that need to, come, that need to take place before uh, you know, an attack happens, uh, we, we've not seen um, a number of things that we believe that, that will have to happen before. What, what are those things that you think need to happen in terms of a plan that would give you confidence that civilian lives would be protected? And, and they have a plan. Uh, the question is, can you execute? Are, are you executing the plan, and, and uh, how much time are you allocating for what it? What are the mo ma main concerns you have of what you've, either the lack of plan or lack of execution? That lack of execution. And what, what, what would be the specific specifics of what you would want to see that they're not doing today? Uh, making prov provisions for the, uh, for the civilians, wh wherever you direct them to. Do you, do you have sustainment uh, uh, in that area? Um, you know, do, do you have the ability to, to move them from where they are now to, uh, to wherever you're going to direct them to? Uh, and then are, are you willing to protect them as you do that? So, uh, you know, the the housing, the, uh, uh, the medical care, all that stuff that, that uh, needs to be in place. Um, you know, we, we've seen some signs that, uh, that some of that's coming together, but, uh, but clearly not. And where, where would they move these million people to? So you're saying before they go into Rafah, they would need to move all the million people out of Rafah who are civilians? I, I doubt that they'll move all of them out, but uh, certainly the preponder pre preponderance of the people, uh, sure. And I, but what if, I can only go two, north because... Let, and I let my times is almost expire. I mean, if there are two, 300,000 left, I mean, do you have a sense if they were to go in how many deaths, civilian deaths we're talking about? Or, I mean, if they were to go in? Well, there have been far too many deaths, uh, civilian deaths already. Uh, and uh, we certainly, uh, if they were to go in, we certainly would want to see uh, things done in a much different way. Uh, and, and the number of civilian deaths would, would depend upon what they're doing and how they're doing it. Uh, but again, um, 
the, the two things aren't gentleman's time's exclusive. expired chair and i recognize the gentleman from georgia mr scott thank you mr chairman i ask unanimous consent unanimous consent to submit for the record an article from financial times dated april 28 2024 Without objection, so ordered. Titled, Western Banks in Russia Paid 800 Million Euro in Taxes to the Kremlin Last Year. Figures represent a fourfold increase on pre-war levels and come as profits jump at European lenders still in the country. And uh, Mr. McCord, I know you've gotten away without questions, but since your degree is economics and a with a master's in public policy, I'm going to come to you with part of this. Um, in this article, one of the paragraphs reads, Western lenders have benefited from the imposition of sanctions on most of the Russian financial sector, which has denied access to the SWIFT international interbank payment system. That made international banks a financial lifeline between Moscow and the West. Secretary Austin, when you uh, started, you said this is a choice between democracy and autocracy. I agree with you 100%. Um, Russia has faced sanctions from the U.S. and our European allies. Uh, those sanctions have in many ways been ignored. Uh, India has certainly bought oil from them, skirting sanctions, and, and we talk about China. We expect that from China. Uh, I would have hoped that India would have supported um, democracy a little better than they have. Uh, my question, Secretary McCord, is uh, how did the Department of Defense and U.S. interagency partners and the militaries of our European allies coordinate to ensure the sanctions enforcement? And how does Ukraine win if the sanctions are not enforced and Russia's economy is allowed to continue to grow? Uh, Mr. Scott, I would say from the start, the administration's approach on Ukraine has been emphasized interagency. Treasury and state in particular have the lead on, on some of the items you mentioned, export controls and sanctions. But we we have mm. between military assistance, you know, security assistance, economic assistance, humanitarian, export controls and, and sanctions ap applied that whole of government approach. Uh, you're citing, I think, some of the if you will, human nature uh, problems that you have of incentives around the world to, to try and evade these uh, for, for individualized gain, perhaps. But uh, I know that uh, Treasury in particular has worked hard to, uh, to, to have an have a effective regime on the front. I'm, half my time's gone, Mr. McCord. I appreciate your answer. I, I, I respectfully disagree with you. I think that the Biden administration could have could have done more to enforce the sanctions, and I think that our European partners could have done more to enforce the sanctions, and I think that if Russia's economy was not growing, then Russia would not have been able to reconstitute its military and its military industrial base the way they would have, and it, and, and it would not be costing uh, the Ukrainians what it is in, in, in people, and it would not be costing the world what it is in, in support financially and with weapons if the sanctions had been enforced. Uh, General, General Brown, what is the impact on the battle space when sanctions are not enforced? Well, you know, not being an economist, but being a warfighter, uh, anyway, I think the key part I would highlight to you is the uh, uh, access to capability on, on either side. And uh, th that can determine the, uh, the outcome of a, a military uh, conflict. The, the quantity and the quality of the weapons that your opponent has because of the money they have. Is, is that a safe answer? That's a fair statement. That's my concern with the sanctions not being forced, not just by the Biden administration, but by our European partners as well. Um, do you have the necessary authorities to take military action against the shadow fleet uh, of vessels that's illegally transporting Russian oil and, and, and funding Vladimir Putin's war? Uh, that, that is not something that we are, uh, from an authority st uh, standpoint, that we are, uh, you know, as a military, um, uh, focused on right now. I mean, we've been focused on supporting Ukraine, um, and we work uh, closely with the interagency on how we identify uh, to address. Uh, uh, I, I, have, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you, General Brown, and, and you too, as well, Secretary Austin. But I will tell you, supporting Ukraine means defeating Vladimir Putin in Russia. And if we're going to defeat, defeat Vladimir Putin in Russia, then we have to do two things. One is we have to enforce the sanctions so that his economy will fail and he cannot continue to, to reconstitute his military and build the weapons that he is and supply the weapons that he is. And, and the other thing is we've got to be willing to punch him back inside Russian territory. 
And so when I see uh, a Biden administration that won't enforce the sanctions and our European allies not enforcing the sanctions, and then when Ukraine hits Russia in Russia, Biden's saying, please don't do that anymore. If Jim's that's a problem. Expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our uh, country's leaders in defense for their service. Uh, eight days ago, uh, I was in, uh, at the Polish uh, Ukraine border visiting with our 82nd Airborne. We were doing uh, a logistical job that no other country in the world uh, could do uh, and thank them for their service. Seven days ago, uh, I spent nearly an hour in, in Kyiv with President Zelensky. Uh, during that time, we had a far-reaching conversation, but time and time again, the, uh, the most important thing he hammered in to all of us, there's only four of us, bipartisan group, but uh, was the need for air defense. You know, in, in Ukraine, they have an air defense. Uh, in Kyiv, their second largest city was getting pummeled as we sat there, Kharkiv, uh, with major attacks. Uh, he thanked us for uh, the supplementary package, but can you tell us what uh, we're able to do to help Ukraine's air defense? They're a resilient country. They're producing their own armaments in the midst of a war. Uh, but what can we do to improve that uh, air defense? Well, certainly, uh, thanks, sir. And first of all, thanks for, uh, for visiting and, uh, and thanks for your support uh, and along with all your colleagues to get, uh, to get the supplemental approved. That, uh, that was a big uh, measure of assurance to, uh, to our, our colleagues there in, uh, in Ukraine and to uh, our, our allies in, uh, in NATO. Um, so as you know, um, I, I convene some 50 countries uh, every month to talk about uh, uh, how we're going to continue to provide uh, uh, so, uh, security assistance to Ukraine at scale and speed. Uh, air defense has, been, has long been one of the things that we have emphasized over and over again. When people were talking about other capabilities, we continue to emphasize that this is what Ukraine needs most. And that's playing itself out to be true as we watch Russia uh, continue to launch uh, missiles that have been supplied by, uh, by you know, uh, uh, North Korea drones that have been supplied by. I'm by, sorry to interrupt, uh, sir. By, uh, Do we have the assets uh, in place, the, the, you know, Patriots missile systems in particular, uh, among that 56 member group to, to do more we, uh, in immediate sense? There are countries that have patriots, and so what, what we're doing is continuing to engage those countries. I have uh, talked to the leaders of several countries, uh, you know, myself, here in the last two weeks, uh, encouraging them to, uh, to give up more capability and, or provide more capability, and, uh, and so we're going to stay with this. Uh, and, and, you know, I talk to the Minister of Defense uh, of Ukraine every week. Uh, and so you know, he, he is clearly aware of what, uh, what we're doing, engaging others, and looking around the world to try to get a, additional capability. But well, well, you have our commitment and my commitment as I talk to our ally leaders, which I do several of them every week in, in my two capacities and committees. So uh, I'll continue to emphasize to them the importance of doing that too. One other quick question, you, just to exp expand a little bit on what Representative uh, uh, Khanna had just said. Uh, few people in the world, I think, know as much as you do uh, about uh, the difficulties and challenges of urban warfare. Uh, uh, I think, I believe you have, and I know the President has talked about lessons learned that we've learned as a country ourselves. Uh, you, you talked about some of the military logistical issues. Can you just briefly in the short time here, there are other issues too in lessons learned uh, in those types uh, of warfare situations, uh, and they affect the civilian population too. Can you just briefly tell us what you've learned? It's clearly one of the lessons that we've learned is, is that uh, you, you have to make sure you're doing uh, all you can to uh, protect uh, civilians. Uh, and, and because if you don't, then, uh, then uh, you'll create a longer term problem for yourself as, uh, as some of those uh, civilians then, then turn against you in the future. And, and so, uh, we've emphasized that a number of times to our colleagues and, and continue to do so. And I talked, I talked to uh, my counterpart in, uh, in Israel on a weekly basis. We've talked some 40 times since, uh, 40 plus times since uh, October 7th. And these are things that we continue to hammer home. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's an imperative. 
Yeah, and I must say, uh, your constant uh, efforts uh, all through this, uh, given the fact you overcame some of your own health issues, is really extraordinary. And I want to thank you for that, and I yield back. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. Thank you, Chairman. I thank the witnesses for their service and appearing here today. Uh, General Brown, has the need for land-based leg of the nuclear tri triad decreased since the decision was made in 2014 to recapitalize the ICBM fleet? Uh, no, it is not. Okay. Um, since that time, China has undertaken what multiple STRATCOM commanders have described as a breathtaking expansion of their nuclear arsenal, including a massive investment in silo-based ICBMs. Do you think that that strengthens the case for modernizing our ICBM fleet? Uh, it does, and I, I would say just uh, when you th think about our, our complete nuclear portfolio, not only our ICBMs, but also with our, uh, our uh, maritime-based uh, capabilities, but also our bombers, all, all those play a role, uh, particularly when you think about the aspect of uh, not only you have a PRC that's advancing, but you also have uh, Russia uh, as a uh, nuclear threat as well. Okay, so to be clear, it's your best military advice that we'll need an ICBM capability for the for foreseeable future, is that correct? It is, because they, that, uh, that it's all part of the triad, and each part of the triad actually plays a key role to ensure that we're able to, uh, not only our strategic deterrence, but the extended deterrence it provides for uh, our allies and partners as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Secretary Austin, I agree with your sentiments that Ukraine is morally right in its resistance against Vladimir Putin and the Russian army. However, I don't think that alone should guarantee United States assistance to carry on this fight in perpetuity without any clear, coherent plan or strategy. And these feelings are shared by my constituents in Tennessee, and I think their frustration is building as the question of what the end game is here continues to go unanswered. Can you help us today describe how things are going to turn out better in, in the upcoming eight months. We're over two years into this war. Uh, we've uh, contributed a lot of money. We've just approved another $61 billion. How do you see this playing out over the next six or eight months? Yeah, we, uh, thank you, sir, and th thanks for your support uh, with the supplemental. Um, we, we've been clear from the very beginning that what we want to see is a democratic, independent, and sovereign Ukraine that has the means to defend itself uh, and, uh, and deter aggression uh, going forward. Now, there are some things uh, in, in the immediate term that I believe that Ukraine needs to, needs to be able to do. One is to maintain access to, uh, to the Black Sea uh, because, uh, as you've seen here recently, they have, uh, they have managed to continue to export grain, uh, uh, you know, using the Black Sea Corridor. Uh, they also have to defend uh, uh, in, the, in the north and east, where uh, we see Russia mounting uh, in, uh, increased uh, uh, small attacks and, and probably uh, maybe are looking to mount a larger attack in the north and east. That's their industrial base, so they have to, they have to support that. And then, and then the, the third thing I think uh, they need to do is, is to uh, place uh, additional pressure on Crimea. As you know, Crimea, Russia is using Crimea as, uh, uh, as kind of a transit zone to, to push up um, supplies and, uh, and personnel in support of their efforts in southern Ukraine and eastern Ukraine. So uh, again, our, our overall goal is to make sure that uh, Ukraine, uh, at the end of the day, remains a democratic, independent, and sovereign uh, state that can defend itself. Okay. And that doesn't really answer the question as far as a strategy, and maybe I didn't ask it directly enough, but I mean, as far as an end game, do we see a, a peace settlement? Do we see outright victory? How long will it be before they come back to the well? We just did 61 billion. Uh, you know, there's been a lot more prior to that. Uh, what can we tell people? I mean, I, the president actually did try to explain this a little bit last week in response to the aid package. He was on TV or at least a visible press conference where he tried to describe it. We've been imploring the DOD and the administration to tell the American people why this is so important, why this investment is there. So what is, in your opinion, the end game timeline? When will it be needing more money? And you know, what's victory look like? As is the case with uh, most uh, conflicts of this type, uh, it ends in, with some sort of uh, uh, negotiation, uh, and, uh, and again, uh, if that happens, when that happens, 
uh, we want Ukraine to be in the best possible position to be able to, to uh, achieve uh, its goals uh, and, and negotiate uh, uh, for, for the right things. Uh, it, it's up to Ukraine when that happens uh, and, and, and what, they, what they choose to, uh, to agree to or not to. Uh, our goal is to make sure that they have the security assistance to be able to uh, continue their fight to protect their sovereign territory. Gentlemen, time's expired. Chair, not recognize the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Slotkin. Hi, Mr. Secretary, Chairman, um, Mike. Good to see you all. Um, uh, I'm, I want to ask a question a little bit different than my peers um, that comes from uh, uh, looking forward at threats. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, you know, your job as the Secretary is to deal with everything that's going on in the world, and it's, it's messy right now, but also to look at future threats. Um, and I want to put on the table um, this idea that the United States is poised to let in a huge flood of Chinese electric vehicles into the United States. In the European Union, they let in their first Chinese EV in 2021. They now have almost 25% market share. So all the cameras, light detection, um, LIDAR, excuse me, radar, data collection, cameras, all the stuff that we have concerns about even putting on our military vehicles, right? Chinese origin um, equipment we would never put on our military vehicles are now poised to be flooded into the United States, driving around everywhere, collecting data on our military bases, on our key infrastructure. Um, as someone who develops our war plans on other states, you can imagine how interesting that data might be to adversaries. Um, so I, I have a few questions. I asked similar ones to the Secretary of the Army when she was here. Um, they're not gotcha questions. I'm just, I'm a CIA officer who was trying to process um, that we, you know, we're concerned about data, you know, who owns the data of a thing like TikTok, and the idea of a fleet of vehicles coming into the United States collecting all this data that's housed and handled by the Chinese Communist Party really bothers me um, as a national security issue. So I have just a series of questions. They're not gotcha questions. They're just legitimately, you know, would we want a potential adversary to have high fidelity 3D maps of every military base and installation in the country? We, we would def definitely not want that. Would we want a potential adversary to have high fidelity maps of infrastructure such as power plants, ports, highways, and bridges? Absolutely not. Would we want any potential adversary to hack into ground vehicles and pilot it remotely or disable a vehicle no. in the United States? No. Would we want a potential adversary to be cut conducting cyber espionage, collecting sensitive intelligence through any phone or Bluetooth enabled device on a ground vehicle? No. Okay, you, you, you get my point here. I think the, the thing that I'm concerned about um, is that um, the United States, we're a free market economy, we value that, we're good capitalists, um, but in today's day and age, some of the most dangerous collection goes on through commercial means. And obviously, I'm from Michigan, you don't have to guess why I'm asking about this, um, um, because we are making the American vehicles where the data is housed here. Um, we asked for a report from the Department of Defense a year ago about the national security implications of Chinese connected vehicles. We have not gotten that report. Um, I know your, your um, congressional affairs people are behind you. I'd ask that we actually see that report because this is about preventing future threats, not just dealing with uh, the admitted mess that we have around the world. Um, um, set, changing gears, um, uh, I just have to ask, we had General Carrillo, the head of CENTCOM, here in front of our committee a few weeks ago, and I asked him, as one of our most decorated officers who got shot three times in Mosul, has served in Iraq, has served in tough places, what is the military strategy for Rafa? Can you articulate the Israeli military strategy for going into Rafa? I'd have to let the Israelis articulate that strategy. Have they provided it to you? Um, We've, we've gotten uh, some concepts, but uh, in terms of detailed okay, plans. Okay, so no, we haven't gotten the military plan. For the, the pier that's being set up, as I understand it, as many as 1,000 U.S. uniformed officers are going to be involved in setting up that pier. A smaller number will be resident there. If we are shot at, if more artillery um, is shot at us, who is responding and with what um, operating procedures is that military responding? Yeah, I've, uh, General Brown and I have spent... Uh, quite a bit of time with uh, General Carrillo working through our 
our force protection plan, and I'm confident that uh, he's put the right measures in place. Will the Israelis be responding if the United States is shot at? This, the Israelis uh, will, will provide uh, additional security in the area. That's right. I just think given the differences I think we have with the Israelis on civilian casualties, we better be, get right clear about what the response is going to be when we are shot at, since I don't think many Americans feel that it reflects the same values that we have here. Thanks very much. Your latest time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. Let's stay on the same subject. Ms. Slotkin just said there'll be about 1,000 U.S. service members operating a peer system off of Gaza. How many of them will have guns, Mr. Secretary? Well, typically all of the uh, deployed service, member carry, uh, service members carry guns, and they have the ability to protect themselves if, if challenged. So if someone from land in Gaza shoots at our service members who are on the $320 million pier that we're building, you're telling me our service members can shoot back? They, they, have, the, they have the right to, uh, to return fire to protect themselves. Now, Well, now do we again, think that's like, so now I want to move to the likelihood that you think someone from land in Gaza might shoot at our service members on this pier. Do you think that that's a likely scenario? That's possible, yes. This is a very telling moment, Mr. Secretary, because you've said something that's quite possible that could happen, right? Shots from Gaza on our service members, and then the response, our armed service members shooting live fire into Gaza. That is a possible outcome here so that we can become the port authority and run this pier, right? Uh, that, that, that's correct. You know, I, I expect that we will always Don't have the ability to protect ourselves. Don't you think that counts as boots on the ground? President Biden told the country that we weren't going to have boots on the ground in Gaza. And we and, won't. Okay, but you guys parse the distinction between, like when Americans think boots on the ground, they think Americans in harm's way or engaged actively in a conflict. You guys seem to be sort of um, saying that boots on a pier connected to the ground connected to service members shooting into Gaza doesn't count as boots on the ground? It, it does not. <laughs> uh, I think you're going to find the, the American people have a different perspective on that. And if we're going to have people shooting into Gaza, we probably should have a vote on that pursuant to our war powers. But I want to bring us now closer to home and the F-35 program. Is the F-35 program a failure? No. it's. Okay, uh, so let's go over it. How much does an F-35 cost? Well, it depends on the variant. but uh, 100 million? Safe, safe to say, 100 million a copy? Okay, so we just had the Air Force in here, and I said, what percentage of these F-35s are fully mission capable? And they said 29%. Do you have any basis to disagree with that assessment? I don't have any basis to disagree okay. with the Secretary. So at 100 million a copy, 29% being fully mission capable, does that seem low to you? It's a complex uh, airframe, and, and again, um, there are a number of reasons why a platform could be in, uh, not operational at any one given time. But, well, right, but I mean, but how having many? Having said that, it I, is a, it is probably it is one of the best aircraft in the inventory. The best aircraft in the inventory. Well, Mr. Secretary, uh, there's a GAO report that takes a very different view. Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to enter the GAO report entitled "F-35 Sustainment Cost Will Continue to Rise While Planned Use and Availability Have Decreased." Without objection, so ordered. It reads, costs to sustain the F-35 fleet keep increasing from $1.1 trillion in 2018 to $1.58 trillion in 2023. Yet DOD plans to fly the F-35 less than originally estimated, partly because of reliability issues with the aircraft. The F-35's ability to perform its mission has also trended downward over the last five years. Is there any of that in the GAO report that you disagree with? Uh, I don't, no. Okay, so how many $100 million paperweights do we own? I would not categorize the F-35 as a paperweight. Well, if, we, if it's not mission capable, if it's, what, what, do we just stare at it and admire it? We, we continue to work to make sure that we, uh, we uh, get our aircraft uh, operational and continue to... Uh, and, and I don't know, don't you think at $100 million a clip, more than 29% should be fully operational? And if the fact that we can't get them operational, you know, you know what Secretary Kendall said when he was sitting in that chair? He said the core root of the problem is that we had let Lockheed Martin build this thing, and then we gave Lockheed Martin the full system performance contract. And they keep bilking us 
according to the GAO, and we sit around staring at a $100 million airplane that can't fully perform the mission, and you're sitting here telling me it's, a, it's not a failure. Just own up to it, Mr. Secretary. Just say, this airframe has not delivered, it's too costly, it's not, it's not being utilized as we should, and we should never again make the mistake of doing a full system performance contract with the very person who built the aircraft. Could we agree to that? I agree. In the future, okay. we should take a, we should have a different approach. I'm sure that Secretary Let, Kendall well, also told I think you the, committee is the things help that he was to doing to get the approach quite quickly. Yeah. Gentlemen's time's expired. Let me uh, give people a, our situational awareness. Votes have been called. There is a series of nine votes, uh, six amendment votes or two minutes. Uh, my plan is to continue for about another 15 minutes before we recess and then come back at the conclusion of the votes. The walk-off time will be 12.30. Uh, with that, Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Moulton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, you said your budget priorities are near-term readiness, modernization, and support for troops and families. Those absolutely seem like the right priorities for me. Uh, Chairman, you've famously said, quote, accelerate change or lose. And of course, you're talking about our pacing China, a pacing challenge, China primarily. But Mr. Secretary, you also explained that your budget, quote, dials back some modernization. Now, how is that compatible with accelerate change or lose? So those platforms that won't deliver capability before 2030 are the ones that uh, we chose not to uh, invest in in this budget. Now, we recognize that we will invest in those, uh, those programs uh, in the out years. Uh, and that will require uh, an increase in the top line. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, most of this committee is in wholehearted agreement that this budget is inadequate. But why would you delay modernization rather than following the lead of the Marine Corps and just cutting old systems, many of which are big and expensive to maintain? Well, that's, uh, that's part of the dialogue we have with, uh, with our Congress. And that's what might be the challenge that I see in some cases where, uh, and it, as we look at the capabilities that we have to have today, at the same time the, uh, uh, as we transform the force to the future, and uh, balancing between the two. And, and that's where the focus has been um, uh, uh, across the force. This is an area that uh, we've got to continue to have dialogue of the things that we were willing to let go of so we can actually invest in and modernize in the future. And well, I, I have no doubt that this is your... Uh, philosophy. I, I question whether it is really the focus across the force. I mean, I think with the exception of the Marine Corps, and, and a, a bit of credit is due to the Air Force as well here, there's been a real reluctance to divest of old platforms. I mean, I asked this question of Army leadership just last week. I said, give me an example <clears throat> of one old platform that you're cutting to make roo room for modernization. And the Secretary of the Army used the future reconnaissance attack aircraft, a future capability. She's talking about cutting a future capability. Can you give me, Mr. Secretary, just a couple of examples of old weapon systems that are big and expensive to maintain that the Army is cutting to make room for modernization? Well, certainly, uh, I mean, if you had the Secretary of the Army here to speak to that, I'm sure that uh, what she told you uh, is, is accurate, so I don't, I don't want to, I won't challenge that. But there are things like older artillery platforms like uh, the uh, M777 uh, that uh, we provided to, uh, uh, to Ukraine that we no longer uh, uh, use in our, in our inventory to the extent that we were before, that, uh, that we are, you know, that we're you know, moving out of the inventory. But s some of these things that are no longer uh, useful for the Army, uh, are useful to us in the next fight. Uh, in, uh, as far as the Army's concerned, we're able to uh, transition those, uh, those items to, uh, uh, to partners and, and allies who, who need that kind of uh, capability. Well, let's do that. I mean, let's sell them. Let's get some money, yeah. right? But we've got to make money in our budget for modernization because if, if we don't accelerate change, accelerate, not just change at the rate that we're changing right now, but accelerate change, we are not going to be able to keep up with China. And Mr. Secretary, I just want to be clear, you are endorsing the Secretary of the Army's response to my question, name an old system you're cutting, when she named a future system that you've chosen not to invest in. No, I, I, uh, the, the reason I said what I said was I, I, I really don't know the full context of, but, but to, to your point, that is a future system and not a, not a system that we would typically look to 
divest of. The systems that we want to divest uh, are the systems that are too, too expensive to, uh, to upgrade, to modernize, or are no longer rel relevant in a future fight. Now, I mean, we, we, we live in a world where $5,000 drones can destroy $5 million tanks. Now, I'm not saying there's never going to be a use for a tank again, but we're still building a lot of tanks. Poland has just agreed to purchase a whole bunch of tanks. I don't know what, what nation they plan to invade with these largely offensive weapons, but that doesn't seem like a very wise investment for us or our allies. So I would just encourage you. I know there are a lot of tank supporters in Congress. There are a lot of F-35 supporters in Congress. But you've got to come to us with tough cuts because coming here and just saying we can't modernize is not acceptable. Replicator is a good example of a, of a revolutionary change. But when they came before the committee, I asked them, you know, Ukraine is innovating a lot on drones. Just tell me, when is Replicator program, with our GDP, going to catch up with Ukraine that has 0.7% of our GDP? And they said, at the present pace, we're not. We can't beat China at that rate. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, and thank you to all three of you for being here today. I want to congratulate General Brown on becoming chairman. We were colonels together, one stars, and base commanders in Europe, so congratulations. Uh, my first question is to Secretary Austin concerning the Ukrainian aid. Is it the administration's plan to send long-range ATACMs uh, to Ukraine? I hope, I hope, hope it's yes. We, we have already done that, sir. Already done it, so, but the, in, the intention is to keep sending more. Well, we, we will provide uh, as much capability as we, as we can. Okay. So. I think that we, we want to ensure that we're sending difference makers. They're not feeding into the gridlock, from my, from my perspective. Uh, General Brown, I want to talk about nuclear survivability. You know, for 29 years, we flew uh, the looking glass 24 hours a day with a general on board that could take over our nuclear forces of the White House, the Pentagon, or Strat Composite. In 1990, we stopped flying that mission and had it on a ground alert primarily. We think the threats are back to what they used to be uh, with, what, with the behavior of Russia and the behavior of China. And now we have weapons that can strike us in 15 minutes, so we think it's even more imperative to have this capability. What are the plans to, to bolster our nuclear command and control survivability? Well, this is a, uh, uh, Representative, it's an ongoing conversation about how we uh, uh, advance our, our nuclear command and control and maintain that nuclear command and control in the, uh, in the environment we're operating in today, uh, particularly against the threat. I would also say uh, as the you we advance the technology, there's also opportunities to uh, change that approach as, as well. And so that's where our, our focus areas are uh, as we look at uh, combined joint all domain command and control how that also feeds into our, our new command and control as well. I know there's alternative ways to, to provide that same capability, but my impression has been, this has been under discussion for years now, I think at some point we need to resolve it and have a plan so that we can, and it's not really for us, it's for Russia and China to know that no matter what they do, they can't catch us asleep and can't decapitate us. And so it seems to me that we should have a plan soon, because <laughs> I just feel like this has been an ongoing discussion of what we should be doing. Uh, so I just want to submit that to you. Back to you, Secretary Austin, on Taiwan. Deterrence starts today, and I'm under the impression we're being told that there's a huge backlog of weapons that we owe, owe Taiwan. Uh, one, one report was $20 billion. Uh, What are we doing to expedite getting these weapons to ta Taiwan? Well, I stood up a Tiger team uh, to address this issue uh, as soon as uh, we came on board, uh, figure out what the nature of the backlogs were, uh, was, and then uh, what are the things that we can do to work through those backlogs and, uh, and, and get this capability to Taiwan and others, quite frankly, as quickly as possible. Uh, they came up with a number of insights. Uh, that task force still exists, by the way, and, uh, and my challenge to them is to continue to work through uh, uh, challenges and, and, uh, and obstacles uh, to make sure that we're moving as, as uh, rapidly as possible. As you know, sir, there are a number of things that go into this equation. You know, industry, uh, uh, in industrial issues and challenges, um, you know, y y you name it. But, uh, but again, I think we have been able to, to, to move some things forward a bit faster, but this work needs to continue, uh, continue on. We're going to reduce the backlog. Uh, I can't predict uh, to you what exactly when that's going to be, but I think uh, 
you know, it's, uh, it's a thing that we'll stay focused on. So. Yeah, day one of the war is too late, and we just know the best way to stop it is mm -hmm. sea mines, harpoon missiles, long-range air defense. And uh, so I think, you know, obviously it's imperative that we expedite uh, those deliveries. Uh, my last thing I would like to uh, point out to Secretary Austin, or at least to discuss, we put a, a 31 recommendations together to improve quality of life in the military. One of them was a targeted pay raise for E1 through E4. And you know, some of the leaders in OSD, I'm not saying yourself, push back on that, saying the pay is adequate. But yet we have good evidence that many of our junior enlists are on food stamps, relying on food banks, and we just think we gotta do better. And there's an article that came out today, or was yesterday, that fast food restaurants are paying more than our E4s are getting, who are, who are not married. So we, we hope that we'll have your support uh, for a targeted pay raise through E1 through E4. And with like 15 seconds left, would you care to comment? Well, I, I want to thank you for the support that you've given us uh, to date. You know, I asked you for a 4.6% pay raise uh, for the force in 23. You supported us. In, in, uh, in 24, the, the budget that was just appropriated, uh, we asked you for a 5.2% pay raise. Uh, you supported us for that. That's the gentleman's time's expired. Chair and I recognize the gentlelady from New Jersey. My intent is to recognize the gentleman from New Jersey and the gentleman from Indiana, and then we will recess till about 12:35. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman, and uh, Mr. Secretary General Brown. Thank you for coming today. Um, I'd like to start off because in February I went with a Hass Codel to Rafa in part to see what was going on because of the concerns over the building humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Um, we then went to see Netanyahu and I, I said to him at that time that there was a growing humanitarian crisis which he needed to address urgently. Um, I encouraged him to open up a res, the Arez crossing, to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza. He did not address this in any marked way until the World Central Kitchen bombing in April. At that time, he did begin to address it, but still not nearly enough to stop the ongoing crisis moving into famine in certain parts of Israel. So part of National Security Memorandum 20's requirement is that the DOD weigh in on Israel's certification that they are addressing this humanitarian crisis. And that's coming up in a little bit over a week, as I understand it. Um, Mr. Secretary, can you tell me about your conversations with the Israelis, um, your discussions about our values and why this is critical, and what the response has been? Well, this is a point I make frequently with uh, my counterpart, uh, and, uh, and, and encourage them to do what's, uh, everything that they possibly can to protect the civilians in the battle space and use uh, the weapons uh, appropriately. Now, this is a professional military, and my, my expectation and the expectation of our government is that, uh, you know, they, they do, in fact, do that. Uh, so this is, uh, again, a, to answer your question, a conversation that we frequently have, uh, and, uh, and again, um, we'll continue to have those conversations because it's really important. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the... Uh, you know, our, our assessment, the assessment that's uh, upcoming, as you know, the state is working on that assessment, and uh, I'll confer with, uh, with Secretary Blinken at some point, uh, but, uh, but we've not had that, uh, that conversation yet. So. And along the same topic, um, we continue to hear Netanyahu say he's invading Rafa. The president continues to push back against that. There still seems to me to be no viable option for a humanitarian corridor or even a place to receive the 1.4 million people in Rafa right now with tents or humanitarian aid. Certainly the vetting process alone, while Netanyahu suggested it would take him two weeks to do, I, I don't think any of our military would suggest that that is enough time. Can you talk about any discussions you've had with the Israelis regarding Rafa and if you, what you believe their war plan there is right now? Again, I you know, emphasized a, a number of times that, that uh, they must do what's necessary to uh, to take care of these uh, civilians that are not, not combatants and, uh, and move them out of the battle space and, and, and take care of them wherever you move them to. Uh, and, and you have to uh, allow sufficient time to do that appropriately. And, and we've had that conversation a number of times. Uh, we, I have seen, some, seen them do, uh, put some things in place, 
but you and I know that there's a lot more that needs to be done before, um, you know, uh, we, we can say that they've accounted for these civilians and, and, and taken care of them. Um, I've also asked them to, uh, to do things sequentially. So that must be the first thing that must be done before they consider any other, any other uh, military operations. So. Thank you. And then changing topic, um, you know, I've, I've grown increasingly concerned because we've seen some of the Supreme Court cases on abortion. And recently, one of those has been EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. Um, and Title X does not cover that. Title X does not cover what EMTALA calls stabilizing care for our civilian facilities, meaning it's not just the health, it's not just the life of the mother, it's the health of the mother. I remain concerned that our service women um, are not being given the opportunity or the protections of their health. And that means that in these hospitals, their reproductive organs are not protected. So in other words, they, the doctors are not required to give them treatment um, simply to preserve their ability to have children in the future. Um, have you looked into this and uh, are we taking any further um, steps to protect our service women and give them better reproductive health care? No, we, we've not. Uh, uh, the reproductive health care policy that uh, that we have in place does not uh, specifically address the issue that you raised, but uh, it, it's a valid issue for sure. I would recommend you get her an answer for the record because we got to go to Mr. Banks. General H. Time's expired. Uh, gentleman from Indiana is recognized. General Brown, according to the Blue Star Families 2023 annual survey of military families, trust in the military is down to the lowest in, that it's been in 20 years down sharply nearly 20% since President Biden took office. The poll also says that only 32% of military families would recommend service to a relative. That's down 55% since 2016. The National Independent Panel on Military Service and Readiness poll says that 68% of active military members have witnessed the politicization of the military. And the Reagan Institute poll in November of 2022 says that only 48% of Americans had a, quote, a great deal of trust in the military, down from 70% in 2018. What, what do you attribute that to? Well, I appreciate the question. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure what I attribute it to. Um, but one of the things I'm focused on, and I highlighted in my, my message to the joint forces, trust is the foundation of our profession. And what I'm focused on is, uh, as, the, uh, as the chairman, is that uh, our trust goes through our members, to their families, our elected leadership, and to the nation. You would agree those are disappointing numbers, startling, uh, if they are true? Well, really I, I will tell you that, uh, um, you know, I, I, as a senior military officer, I want the nation to trust us. And when General, I see numbers like that, uh, it, it is uh, disappointing, and my goal, and is Agreed. to lead by example. Yeah. General Milley testified in this room that, quote, I want to understand white rage. What is it that caused thousands of people to assault this building and try to overturn the Constitution of the United States? What do you think he meant by that, and was it appropriate? I, I don't know what he meant by it. Was it appropriate? Uh, you know, I'm not going to comment on it. General Milley confirmed that he secretly called Speaker Pelosi about President Trump's mental fitness and nuclear command authority. Do you think that's acceptable conduct of someone in your position? Well, I'll tell you in my position, what, I'll, what I will continue to do is provide uh, uh, professional military advice. Would you ever be open to a call with Speaker Johnson about President Biden's mental fitness? I, I'm going to, when I talk to uh, Speaker Johnson, I'll talk to him about the things that are tied to my be military advice. It wouldn't be appropriate, advice. though, would it, someone in your position? I, I'd focus on providing military advice. General Milley, Milley told his aides that President Trump was preaching, quote, the gospel of the Fuhrer. Do you think it's okay for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to compare the commander-in-chief to Hitler? In my position, uh, I, I would... Uh, really? Yes or no, uh, General, that... No. Is that appropriate? It's not appropriate. General Milley testified uh, in a question to me that he, quote, does interviews regularly with print media, books, documentaries, videos on TV because, quote, it is a part of a senior official's job. Do you agree that talking that frequently to the media as part of your job? Do you talk regularly off the record to book authors? I've been, since I've been in this position, I haven't talked to a book author, but I do talk to the media off the record. Okay. General Milley testified to the Senate that he talks to the media, quote, two, three, four times a week. 
and that it is, quote, very important to make sure that senior officials talk to the media. Do you talk to the media four times a week? Uh, not quite that frequently, no. During his farewell address in reference to President Trump, General Milley said, quote, we don't take an oath to a wannabe dictator. Do you think it's acceptable to cause the current commander in chief a wannabe dictator? I, I choose my words wisely. It's not appropriate, is it? No. To call the commander in chief a wannabe dictator. Your term ends on, in October of 2027. There's a presidential election coming up. The current president might win, the former president might win. Um, uh, that, that's, why this, that's why this matters. And the, the politicization of the military is something that I think all Americans care deeply about because it contributes to that decline in the public trust. It contributes to that historic recruitment crisis that we find ourselves in today. And I'm just curious, General, I've always wanted to ask you, how can we repair the damage done by your predecessor who, has a, who will always have a reputation as perhaps the most political general that's ever sat in the position that you sit in today? Well, what I'll focus on is uh, you know, leading by example, uh, knowing and following the, uh, uh, what's expected of us as, uh, as uh, military members, and staying true to my oath. I think it's really important. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, as I said earlier, we will now recess for votes. Uh, my plan is, since we walk off the floor at 1230, we'll reconvene approximately 1240. All right, the chair will now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Carbajal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to all the witnesses here today, um, answering the good questions and the silly questions. I was pleased to see the release of the department's commercial space integration strategy. The strategy mentions working to ensure a safe, secure, stable and sustainable space domain. Secretary Austin and General Brown, what does a sustainable space domain look like to you? And why is this important to achieve? I know it's a bit general. Well, it, first of all, it, uh, it means that we have the right uh, capabilities here to provide uh, um, capabilities to the, to the operators on the surface of the planet. Um, it also means that, uh, that we, are, we have a diverse capability and, and that we're resilient so that uh, we can respond to challenges if, if we are challenged. Uh, so, and, and that's been our, our goal to make sure that, uh, that we build, we continue to build uh, uh, agility and, 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 uh, and redundancy and, and, uh, into, our, into our Space Force capability. So that, uh, so that we can meet challenges going forward. Thank you, General Brown. I, mean, I would add to not only for our, our, our military capabilities for us to be able to do military operations, but it's also how we protect our national interest in having that capability uh, in, in space to uh, uh, deter activity, but uh, also prevent and respond uh, because it impacts not just our, our military, but uh, how we are able to communicate, how we do our, our, our economic uh, transactions and, and many other areas that are important to our security and, and the things that we, we do as a nation. Thank you. Secretary Austin, within the commercial space integration strategy, 13 mission areas in national security space are identified. Six are identified as primarily government, six is hybrid, and just one is primarily commercial, which is space access, mobility, and logistics. How do you see opportunities within the hybrid and primarily commercial mission areas growing for commercial space companies? Well, in terms of uh, opportunities in the commercial sector, for us to work together with the commercial sector, uh, you know, we account for that in our strategy. And uh, we need to do more to, te to, to leverage um, uh, what's in the commercial sector and, and to work together with the uh, commercial sector. I think uh, they've demonstrated the ability to scale and speed some things that I think will be, continue to be useful to us. Uh, and so I think that relationship is really important. So. Secretary Austin, I appreciate you acknowledging in your written testimony the department's failure to generate a clean audit opinion as an issue. 
You said you directed senior leaders to tie performance results to the organization's audit objectives. Can you elaborate on what that looks like in practice and has the directive produced any results or improvements in the audit? And what other steps are you taking to provide oversight of taxpayer dollars? Well, being good stu stewards of taxpayers' dollars is, uh, is really important to us. Uh, and uh, we do have uh, uh, the means, the mechanisms in place to make sure that we are uh, spending in accordance with uh, congressional intent. Uh, and we review our activities and actions uh, r routinely. Um, in October, I published a, uh, a memo to, uh, uh, to DOD and emphasized the importance of uh, uh, reaching our goal of uh, having a clean audit uh, in, in the future. And I rec we recognize that there are a number of things that we need to do between now and then to, uh, to achieve that objective. Uh, but leaders need to, be, uh, need to be focused on this and invested in this. And, and so for that reason, I, I think it's important that, uh, you know, as leaders are rated going forward, uh, we, they get feedback from their supervisors on whether or not uh, they're, they're being supportive of the overall objective. You, you either are or you're not. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty clear. It's a fact. And uh, if they're not, then we need to design those, those steps that uh, we need to take to make sure that we're coming close to meeting our objectives. But this is really important to us. Under, uh, Under Secretary uh, McCord and I have, uh, have uh, worked together hand in hand on this for some time, and we're both committed to making sure that we get a clean audit uh, uh, going forward. So. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm out of time. I yield back. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Waltz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, ma'am, if you could just step aside there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, can you confidently say, I mean, with the American people watching, that the world is safer now three years under President Biden and your leadership? Yes, I can. Mr. Secretary, I have a list here. Uh, where would you say that we're safer? Would you say we're safer in Afghanistan? Would you say we're safer in the Middle East? Would you say we're safer in Africa, the Red Sea, Israel, Europe, South China Sea, the homeland with the FBI director talking about 300 people on the terrorist watch list that's come over our southern border? Where would you say we're safer? Well, we're, we certainly have uh, uh, worked hard to move things to... Uh, to Mr. Uh, Secretary, I know we've worked hard to move things. Where, I mean, it should be a simple answer. You said, yes, you could confidently say we are safer after three years of your and the well, president's take, leadership. Take a look, Where take, are we safer? Take a look at Europe, for example. What, what, if we, what if we were not doing what we're doing in support of Ukraine? Uh, where, where would Europe be right now? Mr. Secretary, Europe has the largest land war on your watch. On the president's watch, deterrence failed. Do you agree that deterrent? Do you think the deterrence worked in Europe? P Putin was was not going to be. P Putin was intent on. on uh, he could not be deterred. Putin was intent on on, on uh, invading uh, Ukraine. He's been so for a long time. Uh, he didn't recognize. So would you Ukraine take that same moniker to the to the Pacific? That she who's openly talking about preparing for war, he's going to invade no matter what and therefore can't be deterred? I mean, he, this but, is... But he hasn't. He hasn't done that. Look and at and, ISIS and our goal is to make sure that he doesn't do it. ISIS is back. But, you, but we failed to do that. You failed to do that in Europe. I mean, deterrence failed. Let's at least agree that it, if, if we, we, we may were, take action if since. We, if we were not doing what, we were, what we're doing... Mr. Secretary, the, 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 your answer is Europe is, the sa is safer after three years. So I'm talking Red Sea, I'm talking our ally Israel, I'm ta talking about ISIS is back, Afghanistan, the, the, the next Saigon. It is, it is a complex uh, environment, uh, but, but it, without our uh, work, without our intervention, in a number of cases, it would be far, far worse. You know, we, we have not only kept NATO together, That is a tyranny together, of low NATO expectations. Has you know, if you look at what's going on in the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, our relationships there are, are stronger than, they, than they've ever been. Uh, and, uh, and again, with your help, we continue to invest in the capability capacity to make sure we Mr. make Secretary, it. Secretary, we're going to state this right here. The second Thomas Shoal off the coast of the Philippines 
could be the next flashpoint to launch World War III. Our enemies and our adversaries no longer respect and fear us. And that has happened and deteriorated precipitously in the last three years. And I find it astounding that your answer of what's safer is Europe with the death and destruction that's going on there. But let's switch there, to domestic. There's, there's no, no, no question that it's a challenging uh, uh, and complex environment. But uh, again, without our work, without our uh, Mr. intervention, just in without the, our support. I have another allies, important issue, and I just work. want your, your, your answer on this. So let's, so let's talk about the state of our military. I have here pictures of mold, feces, uh, Leaks. This is just a sample of 10 facilities out of the 500 under your leadership. Should our soldiers be living in crap? This is unacceptable. And I, I would hope as a commander you would think so as well. Our troops deserve the very best uh, uh, living uh, quarters. And that's why we're investing one, we're asking you to invest $1.1 billion uh, towards uh, unaccompanied housing in this budget request. Actually, you have cuts of $370 million to the FSRM, Family Sustain Facility Sustainment Restoration and Modernization. You also have a cut to military construction and family housing in your budget, Mr. Secretary. So let me just ask you for the crap and the mold and the feces. Who's been fired at those installations? Who's been held accountable? Because your Assistant Secretary testified no one. In, in terms of that particular um, um, incident or issue, uh, I don't know of anybody that's, uh, that was fired. So. That's the problem. We have, a lot, we have a lot of talk about responsibility. You're sending the signal of no accountability. No one's been held accountable, and when that happens, as a leader, you're sending the message that this is acceptable. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair, I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Jacobs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Secretary Austin, General Brown. Thanks so much for uh, being here today. Um, I, I wanted to uh, ask you about what's happening uh, in Israel and Gaza. I know many of my colleagues have already expressed um, discomfort at the idea of a Rafa invasion. I'd like to add my name to those who think that it would be disastrous uh, not only for Palestinian civilians, but also for Israeli security. Um, but, but I, I wanted to actually ask you about U.S. weapons in Gaza and, uh, you know, what kind of oversight we're doing. I know, Secretary Austin, you have been a real leader in holding our own military to account on civilian casualties. Uh, I have been really grateful to work with you uh, and make sure that we in Congress are giving you the tools you need to implement the civilian harm mitigation and response action plan that you have championed. Um, and I know you answered to one of my colleagues that, you know, as we've seen in many places, civilian casualties, human rights abuses can actually lead to more recruitment and violent extremist ideology, the very thing that we're often trying to uh, address when we are doing these kinds of counterterrorism operations. So, so with that in mind, um, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, some of the, the specific incidents we've seen. Um, and in particular, just yesterday, Amnesty International came out with a report citing multiple examples of Israel using U.S.-made weapons in violation of international humanitarian law. Um, as you know, as outlined in National, Memorandum, uh, National Security Memorandum 20, both the State Department and the Department of Defense are required to conduct assessments of whether U.S. weapons are implicated in such potential violations. Uh, and while I think we both agree that Israel has a right to defend itself, how it defends itself really matters. Um, so I was wondering, has the Department of Defense, in coordination with the State Department or on its own, conducted any such assessments of the use of U.S. weapons as required by NSM-20? Yeah, so the State Department has a lead in, uh, in, in providing the assessment, and, and we, are work we will work with the State Department uh, as they uh, pull together that assessment. Okay, well, I will um, look forward to seeing that assessment. I, I think that, um, you know, a as the memorandum says, both departments have a responsibility. I just want to go through a, a few of the specific incidents that they outlined in the report. And again, the report just came out yesterday, so I'm sure you haven't had a time to, to pour through it yet. Um, but, but I think it's important uh, to, to point these out. So according to this Amnesty International report that came out yesterday, uh, an Israeli strike on January 9th, 
uh, reportedly used a U.S. made, U.S. provided GBU 39 small diameter bomb and killed 18 civilians. According to this report, there was no indication that the residential building hit could be considered a legitimate military objective or that the people in the building were military targets. Have we conducted any sort of assessment on this particular incident? I am not aware of that particular incident, but certainly uh, that is one of the things that I, I will uh, engage my, my uh, counterpart on, uh, as I have engaged them on a number of other things uh, before now uh, that uh, relate to um, what we're doing to uh, ensure that we're being as precise as possible in terms of our targeting and what we're doing to protect civilians uh, in the battle space. Uh, but in terms of that specific report that you just mentioned, I've not seen that. So. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, and like I said, it came out yesterday, so I, I didn't expect you to have read it yet. Um, one other incident I just wanted to highlight that came out from that report was uh, an incident from even earlier in the conflict um, uh, in October of 2023. Uh, the report uh, alleges that the Israeli military used U.S.-made joint direct attack munitions JDAMs, uh, in two airstrikes on homes full of civilians that killed 43 civilians total, 19 children. Um, is this an incident that you are aware of? And, ha and if so, have we done uh, any sort of assessment of it? Uh, I, I am not aware of that specific incident. Uh, but again, um, I have encouraged uh, Israeli leadership to investigate thoroughly any, uh, any sort of incident like this where there is... Uh, um, a report of a loss of uh, life, uh, civilian loss of life. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the Minister of Defense uh, assures me that, uh, number one, they have the right, uh, they have adequate targeting uh, procedures. And number two, they will follow up and investigate if there is, a, is an well, is an issue. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I think it's important that given that these are U.S.-made weapons, we don't only rely on U.S. on Israeli investigations, but we actually do our own uh, assessments as well. Um, so I will look forward General to following up with you on this. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back the time <laughs> that I do not have. <laughs> I thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our witnesses for being here today. General Brown, it's great to see you again, sir. Always enjoy having uh, a Texan here in the uh, committee before us, especially one that's uh, spent time out in West Texas. Uh, Secretary Austin and General Brown, would you both please answer the following questions as briefly as possible? From your perspective, what is the role of Special Operations Forces in the Department of Defense? Uh, special Operations Forces are uh, clearly um, a remarkable advantage uh, for us, a, a remarkable asset. They, they add value uh, in every, uh, every endeavor, and, uh, and, you know, they're very uh, difficult to, uh, uh, to train and equip in terms of the amount of time that it takes. And so, uh, but having said that, they, uh, they provide value uh, uh, in a number of ways, and so we treasure their, uh, uh, their contributions. In the interest of time, General Brown, do you agree with that? Uh, I do. Okay. Uh, when you think about a conflict in the Indo-Pacific, uh, is there a unique role that special operations forces might play there? You, you both, either one of you, both of you. Yes, 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 there is a unique okay, role. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, more broadly, are there still threats to the American interest in the Middle East and Africa from our adversaries? Yes. Okay. If you certainly consider the transnational terrorist threat an adversary, certainly. Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, is it fair to assume that special forces might be utilized to conduct operations in CENTCOM, AFRICOM, and Indo-PACOM at some point in the near future? Yes. Do you agree? Yes, and I, I would say uh, not, not only uh, special operations forces, but pretty much all of our joint force can uh, be expect to be engaged in various uh, forms, uh, depending on what the threat or what the situation is. Thank you. Uh, would you both agree that special operations forces are a critical component of any of our plans in order to be successful uh, against uh, our adversaries, uh, our prime adversaries in these areas? Yes, I would. Yeah. Yeah, yes, they are, and okay. one of several critical components. Thank you. Uh, would you both say that generally the demand signal for special operations forces is extremely high right now? It, it is high, uh, and there, it's a small force, so uh, it's a high-demand, low-density uh, resource. Thank you. 
I, I mean, I would agree, but I would say the demand signal has changed uh, uh, because the environment's changed a bit, uh, uh, particularly in the... Uh, okay. Um, and do you both think that, uh, that our special operations forces are uh, more capable than, our, than their Chinese, Russian, or Iranian counterparts? I, I would tell you that our special operations forces are the best in the world. Yes, sir. I agree. Uh, same, General? I right. agree. Uh, do you believe that our special operations forces provide our military with an advantage over our adversaries? They do. They're certainly working in conjunction with uh, uh, conventional forces. They absolutely do. They do. Okay. Uh, personally, I believe that our special forces, like you, you stated, are, personally, are, are the most skilled operators in the world and provide one of the greatest advantages uh, when we look at possible future conflicts. Unfortunately, there are proposals out there that, right now that are looking to cut thousands of personnel from special operations community, and I personally believe that this is a huge mistake. I understand the budget realities that, we, that we're facing, but if we're going to be looking for ways to pay the bills in the department, surely we can find better options out there than intentionally degrading our special operations capability. I would urge each of you and my colleagues here on the committee that cutting special operations is not the answer, that we need to ensure that our special operations forces capability is adequately resourced and supported. So I just wanted to go on the record saying that. Uh, one more quick question. Uh, the Texas Panhandle is home to the Pantex plant uh, in the United States, which is the only nuclear weapons assembly and disassembly facility. Most people don't know this, but the Department of Defense relies heavily on the National Nuclear Security Administration and the Department of Energy to provide the nuclear portion of our nuclear weapons. However, I'm constantly concerned that the administration does not share the urgency that each of us here in this room do with regards to nuclear modernization. At the Pantex plant, a Department of Energy facility where critical work is done to modernize the nuclear triad, there is currently work being done on the buildings that were built in the 1940s where the ceiling is literally crumbling. My concern on this is more with the National Nuclear Security Administration because of the Department of Defense has been firmly committed to nuclear modernization from everything I'm told and I've seen. But we need our entire national security apparatus to be on the same page and working together. To that point, this year, uh, the National Security Administration requested zero dollars for two key mission-enabling construction projects at Pantex, including the new analytic gas, gas lab uh, to replace the current one that was built in 1945. We spend all of our time talking about modernization and quality of life issues, but there appears to be somewhat of a disconnect between the Department of Defense and the rest of the executive branch when it comes to these key investments for nuclear modernization. So I'm running out of time here. I just want to make sure that uh, I got on the record saying that I hope that you, we, uh, that you guys can continue to support us and work with those other Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Vasquez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Austin, General Brown, for taking the time to speak with us this morning. It's good to see you again. I hope you're feeling well, Mr. Secretary. I have the privilege of representing New Mexico's second congressional district, home to White Sands Missile Ridge and the Trinity site, the location of the first ever atomic weapons test. Uh, now, Secretary, you, you may be familiar uh, with what's been happening in Congress uh, over the last year regarding RICA uh, and expanding RICA in particular, the Radiation Ex Exposure Compensation Act. Now, in New Mexico, uh, we're unfortunately sometimes known as the nation's nuclear dumping ground and also the nuclear weapons testing site of the Trinity site, the first ever atomic bomb tested in New Mexico by the federal government. Now, we haven't had the compensation for the folks who have suffered and their generations of families who have suffered subsequently for that nuclear bomb testing. We're also home to places like the Jackpile Mine, right outside of Laguna Pueblo, where uranium mining has taken place for years uh, without re proper remediation that has contaminated water sources and that has also impacted those miners. So we desperately need help for the folks that are in New Mexico that have suffered from the impacts of what the federal government caused. So without warning, Nearly half a million New Mexicans without, within a 150-mile radius of the Trinity site were exposed to deadly ionizing radiation and given no information about the dangers of radio radioactive effects following the test. Let me say that again, Secretary, without warning. Now that several of my Republican colleagues have supported RICA reform, folks like Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri, Representative James Moylan from Guam, I believe it's imperative that we pass RICA reform. Secretary Austin, does the Department of Defense apologize on the record for exposing New Mexicans to deadly radiation during the Trinity test? Well, let me just say up front that uh, safety and, and health and welfare of our troops and our families is very important to us, uh, as well as uh, uh, health and welfare of the community members. Um, and, and so this is something we take very seriously. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, we, we would want to ensure that everyone that's 
uh, been disadvantaged uh, is, is compensated. But I would point out to you that the Department of Justice is the lead agency for, uh, uh, in terms of overseeing the compensation program. So. And Secretary, uh, do you believe that a harm done by the federal government uh, should be fixed by the federal government? I, I do. Okay. Um, do you think an apology is in order for all those uh, generations of families that have not received proper compensation for exposure to deadly radiation? If there's something that, uh, uh, you know, community members have suffered because of our action, then certainly we should apologize for that. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so would you support additional expansion of RIGA to compensate the victims of radiation? Well, certainly. I'm, I'm in favor of making sure that that people who have been uh, disadvantaged are, are adequately compensated. So I, I support that. Yeah. Thank you, Secretary. I appreciate it. And that's why I'm fighting to reauthorize and expand RICA in this year's NDAA to finally bring justice to these communities like those in New Mexico and beyond who have been suffering for far too long. Uh, thank you both for your dedicated service, uh, General Secretary, to our country and for all you do to support our brave service members in uniform. With that, I yield back my time. Thank you, Chair. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes a gentlelady from South Carolina, Ms. Mace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Austin and General Brown. Thank you uh, for being here today. Secretary Austin, under your COVID-19 vaccine mandate on our service members, more than 8,400 service members were discharged for declining to take the COVID-19 vaccine. Those 8,400 men and women served our country honorably. And you turned each of these soldiers, sailors, and airmen and women into veterans overnight. The fiscal year 2023 NDAA rescinded this mandate, but eight months later, only, only 43 service members had sought to rejoin, just one half of 1%. That is why, as part of fiscal year 2024 NDAA, Congress established a process to reinstate service members who were discharged due to your actions. How many of these service members have been reinstated since the passage of the 2024 NDAA? Well, I, I don't have an, uh, that number at my fingertips, but I would tell you that uh, um, each of the services certainly have uh, procedures if somebody wants to reapply for, to, to join, uh, join the military, then they can, they can certainly do that. So. And then uh, why has the Department of Defense failed to convince more of these service members to rejoin, you think? Again, it's a, it's a choice, by, a personal choice by, by the former service members to, to make that decision. So if they want to come mm -hmm. back, there's a method to do that. Can you describe the efforts of the DOD, what efforts they have made to recruit these service members to rejoin? I don't know of any efforts that have been made to, to uh, recruit from that population. So. Well, given our shortcomings, our shortfalls in recruiting, don't you think that might be a, a group, a pot of, of folks that we'd want to try to recruit back to rejoin or no? Yeah, as you may have heard me say earlier, I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our services are doing well in terms of uh, rec uh, turning the, the trend around and really are, uh, in, in most cases, going to make their recruiting goals. How, well, to that end, uh, by how much do the military services collectively miss their recruiting goals in fiscal year 2023? Well, uh, let's talk about 2024, what the services are projecting. Um, my question was about 2023. How, how badly do they miss their goals? There were a number of services that missed their, missed their objective. Approximately, the answer is approximately 41,000. Um, could retaining the 8,400... But, but having said that, yeah. I know you've talked to the Army and to other services already, and they, they have probably told you that uh, their forecast is that they're going to meet their recruiting goals, and that's, that's because they've done the right things and in investing in the right kind of advertisement, uh, investing in the right types of recruiters, uh, establishing contacts with the right centers of influence, uh, and telling the military story and, and what the military what military service offers you. Yeah, and I, and I hope you're right. I, I really, truly do. I come from a military family where almost everyone serves, and I hope that we do meet those goals uh, sooner rather than later. Today is the last day of April, the last day of Sexual Assault Awareness Month, so I want to turn to a topic that is deeply personal and deeply important to me, uh, particularly as a woman. I was deeply disturbed to learn last year the first Army Special Trial Counsel had to be fired because emails came to light where he said things like sexual assault ridiculousness. The sexual assault ridiculousness continues. He also wrote that Congress and our political masters are dancing by the fire of misleading statistics and one-sided repetitive misinformation by those with an agenda. He later downplayed the issue of sexual assault 
as sobriety regret, end quote. So Secretary Austin, how, many vic how can victims of sexual assault, like myself, have confidence in coming forward when the Army or military, anyone, hires someone that says these things to lead the special division to handle their cases, and how the hell did the DOD miss this in the vetting process? Well, I don't know specifically how, how uh, the Army missed that, but I, do, mm -hmm. I can tell you that once the Secretary of the Army uh, was aware of the, of the issue, then she took action, and, uh, which you would expect her to do. And, and again, that in and of itself proves that, uh, that we're serious about, uh, about uh, sexual assault, sexual abuse. And, and again, this individual, as you pointed out, would have been in charge of uh, ensuring that uh, we live up to our standards and make, making sure that, that uh, cases are, are appropriately referred and, and, and tried, and, and so a very important person in the, in the chain. And so the Secretary of the Army uh, did what she thought was best. And do you think women um, should have confidence in the military to come forward when they are assaulted? Is the military doing everything they can to ensure that those women get justice when they've been assaulted or raped? I absolutely believe that, and I know that uh, there's still, a, in some cases, a reluctance, a reluctance to report uh, assault or or, uh, or, uh, or, or abuse, and, and, and so we want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable that uh, they can come forward, report, and there will be... Uh, General Lady's right. time's expired. Chair, now recognize the General Lady from Hawaii, Mr. Kuda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, when you came before this committee last year, we briefly talked about infrastructure investments. You stated then that it's absolutely important that the department does everything it can to ensure that it continues to update its infrastructure. Now, I know that the department has had to make some tough choices in its fiscal year 2025 budget request to align with the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which I regret imposes harsh caps on both defense and domestic spending. However, I am struck by the fact that the department's FY25 budget proposed reductions in facilities, sustainment, restoration, and modernization funding by $370 million and military construction by $117 million compared to the fiscal 24 enacted levels. Uh, Indopaycom's unfunded priorities list further identifies over $3.3 billion in MILCON priorities that aren't included in this year's budget. Given all that, Mr. Secretary, how confident are you that your budget request includes and prioritizes adequate funding that we need to sustain and build infrastructure, especially in the Indo-Pacific, where our state is, is located, where these investments are critical to our posture and force projection? Yeah, we continue to... Uh invest in infrastructure, it is really important. Uh, in some cases, so we have to make up for, for lost time and, and uh, in, in terms of investments that should have been made uh, years ago uh, in, in terms of restoration and other things that weren't made. Uh, in, in this budget, we're asking you for uh, $2.2 million, a billion dollars uh, for family housing. We're asking you for a billion dollars, $1.1 billion for um, uh, unaccompanied housing, and, uh, and, and in terms of the Indo-Pacific and the Pacific uh, Deterrent Initiative that you, that you mentioned, and we're asking for $9.9 .9 billion there, and, and some of that will go into infrastructure. And over the last three years, we've asked you for $20 billion in support of, uh, of infrastructure, and, and, and we we're very grateful for the support that you provided, and we'll continue to work at this. Thank you. Well, the bottom line is we need numbers of that sort if we continue to defer investments in our repair and maintenance in previous years. And so if we are going to be true to investing and supporting infrastructure, we have to invest now. We need to put our money where our mouth is so that we can better manage the risks and the cost that comes with extreme deferred infrastructure investments. And we need to make sure that we build and sustain the infrastructure we need to compete with our adversaries and to take care of our soldiers and their families as well. I want to pivot right now to the ongoing conflict in Gaza. I know many of my colleagues have asked questions about that today, and I share their concerns as to how U.S. supplied weapons are being used in the, by the Israel Defense Forces and whether adequate steps are being taken to protect civilian life, especially with the looming operation in Rafah. This includes reports of an October 31st airstrike on the Jabalia refuge camp that killed over 125 people and may have involved a U.S.-provided bomb. 
the possible use of white phosphorus in areas populated by civilians on October 16th, and the continuing use of U.S.-made precision-guided missiles and artillery in Israel's defense. Mr. Secretary, would you please describe the department's efforts to conduct end-use monitoring of U.S.-provided weapons to Israel in this conflict, specifically to determine the credibility of the written assurances provided by the Israeli government pursuant to NSM-20? Yeah, the vast majority of equipment that the Israelis use is provided by the United States in terms of air, air ground munitions, and I think uh, everybody's aware of that. Um, it, it, the Israeli military is a professional force. Our expectation is that, uh, that they conduct their operations uh, uh, as professionals would, and that they account for civilians in the battle space and make sure that uh, they, have, they have good targeting processes and they follow those processes. Um, in, in terms of um, making sure that we're engaging the Israelis uh, on these issues, I do that every week as I talk to uh, my counterpart in Israel. Uh, this is one of the things that I, I really emphasize routinely. Uh, and, uh, and again, it's been so, a Mr. tough battle. Mr. Secretary, but there's been if, far too many civilians that have been. Absolutely. Involved. So, Mr. Secretary, if I'm hearing you right, then we're taking them on their word that they are abiding by the provisions in NSM 20. Are we doing any ex of our own monitoring and use monitoring to make sure that we know exactly how that's being done to prevent the loss of life, civilian, cal civilian casualties? Well, as you know, in, in accordance with NSM 20, we'll have to provide, uh, the State Department in conjunction with uh, Defense, we'll have to provide an assessment on whether or not uh, they are doing just that. And so so in, that a, in a week or so when we are to get that report, then it's going to show us with some credibility that you're not just taking them on their word, that you have actually been able to show that, in fact, these weapons have not been used in ways that they should not be. Gentlelady's time has expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Strong. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, Secretary Austin, uh, General Brown, Mr. McCord. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, a phrase we've heard routinely from senior leadership at the Pentagon is production deterrence. The Alabama way of saying this is we've got to keep the clip full. Uh, the missile industrial base needs uh, stable production expectations, uh, expanded uh, capability, and resilient supply chain. I've been a licensed emergency medical technician for almost 35 years, and one of the contractors back home explained it to me like this. It's hard to run a missile industrial base when your demand signals look like a heart monitor, ordering 150 one year, none the next, 150 the next year, none the next. We've been reminded in the past year the, criti uh, the criticality of increasing our air and missile defense cap uh, capacity, especially in Israel and the Middle East. This, uh, the Secretary of the Navy recently shared that we have uh, expended a billion dollars in missile uh, inventories in the Red Sea uh, mission, which included the use of the SM-3 missile in combat for the first time to defeat Iranian ballistic missiles. Uh, just last week, I uh, went to the uh, groundbreaking in Huntsville for a facility expansion where 60% of the work uh, is for the SM-31B. This is uh, initiated after uh, demand signals in recent years to crank up production. Despite this, the department has now proposed termination of the SM-31B. I'm especially worried about the workforce uh, uh, and what this is, the signal this is sent. One, I understand the Constraint and Financial Responsibility Act, so what I would like to know from you is, was this just a budget decision despite our commitment over the last two years to protect missile uh, funding for critical uh, munitions? Uh, are we again using missiles as a bill payer to meet the priorities? As we, as we discussed earlier, we, we certainly had to make tough choices uh, uh, as we uh, built our budget request based upon the, the FRA. Um, but since Raytheon is a prime vendor for this uh, this weapon uh, weapon system, uh, I'll take uh, I'll take your question for the for the record out of, out, out of uh, an abundance of caution. There, as you know, I used to serve on the board of Raytheon. So. Okay. Uh, thank you. Given the sudden change in plans, I'd like to ask 
that you provide this committee the uh, analysis supporting the termination decision, including analysis of the SM3 capability uh, against current and future threats, risk to the industrial base and workforce, and the ability of the Navy to meet missile defense requirements with significantly fewer um, effectors. Uh, Secretary Austin, I'd like to thank the Department for sticking to the facts and doing uh, what is best for national security as it conducts the Inspector General and GAO investigation into the Space Command base decision. I'm confident uh, that should the Department continue in pursuit of the truth, it will once again find Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama to be the best place for Space Command and best for national security. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the remainder of my time. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. McClellan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Secretary Austin and General Brown for being here today. Um, I want to focus a little bit on uh, child care, um, and I appreciate in your submitted remarks that you pointed out that the um, FY 2025 budget is focusing on efforts to make child care more affordable. Um, but for the past year, what I have been hearing as I visit installations across Virginia as late as Friday when I was at Fort Greg Adams is affordability is only part of the issue. And for, and for many of these installations, it's the lack of sufficient workforce to meet the demand. And so I wanted to ask if you could elaborate what, what the DOD is doing to help increase the workforce, including uh, making the ability to do background checks a little bit faster, because I hear that seems to be the long pole in the tent. Uh, we are doing things to speed up uh, uh, the amount of time that it takes to conduct background checks, and you are right, that has been a, uh, an issue of concern uh, for a number of people for quite some time. Uh, we're also doing things to incentivize uh, workers uh, working for, uh, for us in, uh, in the, in the uh, child care uh, arena. Uh, if you're an employee, for example, uh, we, uh, if you want your child to uh, be enrolled in that child care center, we, we reduce the cost of the first, uh, uh, for the first child by 50%. And there are other things that we're doing to try to make it more attractive uh, for us to, uh, uh, more attractive for people to come work for us. But this is a, there's comp stiff competition, as you know, in this uh, uh, in this area, and uh, we've just got to do continue to do more to attract the right people uh, to join us and and stay with us. Uh, and we've seen some improvement, but there's more to be done yet. So. Thank you. I know this is not just a problem for the DoD; it's a problem in the civilian world as well. But if there are more resources or or, or assistance that we can provide, please let us know. Um, on mental health and suicide prevention, these are also difficult issues we continue to grapple with. In September of 2023, you signed off on a memo with over 100 actions to prevent military suicide, targeting five primary lines of effort. And can you uh, tell us today how the department is beginning to implement those directives and how we can be supportive? Well, we, we are implementing them, and uh, of course, I am personally involved in this because it's, it's really important to me. And um, I, uh, uh, I routinely engage uh, service leadership uh, in, in terms of what they're doing and uh, in, uh, in how they're, how they're uh, making health care or mental health care more available to their, to their troops. Uh, and, uh, and so this remains a focus for the department from the top to, to the bottom. Uh, but it's still a very, I mean, it's a competitive market. Uh, uh, it's, uh, there's just not enough health care providers, mental health care providers, uh, and the, the, the uh, demand is pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, significant. Uh, we've done some things like uh, make uh, telehealth care uh, available, and uh, that's helped the people who are uh, working and living in remote areas. Uh, and, uh, and again, there, there's much more that, uh, that we need to do, but, uh, but it will remain a, a, a very competitive uh, uh, market because there's just not enough providers out there in the civilian world or in the military. So. Thank you. Um, we had the opportunity to speak with leadership for AFRICOM in a posture hearing earlier 
uh, following the military coup in Niger. And since then, we have seen a further weakening of the American position in Africa as our troops have been ordered to leave uh, Chad as well as Niger, two nations that are vitally important to our counterterrorism efforts. Um, and you may not have time to answer this, so for the record, if you could provide how the department is working to prevent uh, similar troop evictions from our African partners and what the department is doing to strengthen ties with our partners in Africa, um, would love to have that. For the record. Thank you. And finally, I would just say after my visit to Fort Greg Adams, um, one of the challenges I think with meeting recruitment goals is the fact that particularly since COVID, uh, the inability to be more further integrated in the communities and, and Fort Greg Adams is a good example where you have two military museums, a great new exhibit on the 6888. Um, and, and uh, black women who participated in the war effort, and yet civilians have a hard time getting on campus to see them. If there's anything we can do to help you meet that balance between providing security at the gate, but allowing time's more expired. people from the Chair, community. Chair, I recognize the gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. Kiggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to General Brown and Secretary Austin, Mr. McCord, for being here with us and for your service to our great nation. I know we, we've had a lot of us speak today about the defense budget being inadequate and our concerns with that. Uh, just noteworthy a, a takeaway from a brief I went to about the pier that, that is being established off of Israel. $330 million was the price tag that we were given. 1,100 servicemen men and women from Virginia uh, who are being sent there, in my opinion, in harm's way. So that unilateral action, I, I sometimes question our priorities about how are, how are we prioritizing the, the inadequate defense budget that we do have. But that raises a lot of questions. I want to echo some of the words of my colleague uh, about the F-35 and had my staff print on our break about the, the GAO report, which is quite scathing if you haven't had a chance to to read it. I was shocked to just hear about and read about the sustainment costs that have increased 44%. So they went from 1.1 trillion in 2018 to 1.58 trillion in 2023. So since 2014, they made 43 recommendations to improve the department's operations sustainment of the F-35 program and that DOD has implemented uh, only, only uh, a few of them. So 30% remain unimplemented. So about 70% of those recommendations remain unimplemented. Do you know what what the Department of Defense is going to be doing in order to get those F-35s off of the flight line uh, at you know in Texas? They're not doing us any good sitting on the flight line. I also want to put a shout out for places like Naval Air Station Oceana in my district, the East Coast Master Jet Base. We need those F-35. Let's get them in the fleet. Let's get the, the pipelines going for maintenance, for operations, for manufacturing so that we can maybe reduce some costs that way. But but do you have plans uh, in mind for how we can, can get those uh, F-35s into the fleet and reduce those costs? Yeah, I'll, uh, I, I can take part, partly because uh, I was, uh, as the Air Force Chief that I was uh, seven months ago, uh, part of the conversation here was to make sure that we are, we're getting what we pay for. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, Lockheed Martin had uh, was basically getting to TR3, which is the Trek refresh to get the Block 4, which is the capability required for our pacing threat was not on time. And that's what's driving uh, part of the uh, conversation of being able to get those uh, those airplanes from Lockheed Martin and getting them out to the field so they can uh, be employed. And why is it not on time? And what are we doing to make sure that it can, will be on time? Well, it's engaging with the industry. And I'll just tell you, in my last role as the uh, uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, I sat down with uh, three of our CEOs from our industry partners that have a key role in this to tell them we have a problem. We have a problem that we have to work together to make sure that we uh, we provide the capability that's, uh, that we're paying for. Please provide that oversight and hold their feet to the fire because I hear from my friends, the F-18 pilots who are flying only F-18s out of Oceana, that they're having to change their tactics on a weekly basis to keep up with the Chinese. If we have better equipment out there for them, let's get it in their hands so they can start practicing for it so we can be ready for that fight tonight. Also, I had the privilege of sitting on the Recruitment Retention Quality of Life Task Force, which I'm, I'm hoping that you all have a copy of the Quality of Life Panel Report that we put together with some great changes in there. I want to hear from you all how uh, you know we're going to do our part in the NDA, NDA side and implement these changes in that, but how are you all going to get these messages out to Americans that 
we hear you. We are working on those things. We've improved pay. We, we've heard you about child care. We're expanding that. We're working on health care, spouse employment, housing. You know, how are we going to get that word out to the American people? Because it hurts my heart when I hear from parents in my district who are veterans like myself who are telling me, I'm telling my kids not to sign up to be in the military. And as, as a mom of, of children who do serve, you know, I, I know what life looks like out there for them. So we need to get this message that we've heard them. We are putting good plans in place for change. But I don't know if there's a, a new PR. Some of our money can go to a big PR campaign. Or what are we going to do that, to get that message to Americans? Well, first of all, let me thank you for the tremendous work. And, yeah, I have gone through the, uh, the report, and my staff, along with the joint staff, uh, is looking at it to, to make sure that uh, everything that we can do to, to implement uh, the things that you guys have brought forward, and, and certainly we're going to take that on. But I will tell you that uh, we've done a lot. You know, one of my, one of my uh, um, areas of focus has been taking care of people. And that's why, again, I asked you for a pay raise in 23 or 4.6% uh, last year, or in 24, I asked you for a pay raise of 5.2%, uh, biggest pay raise in 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and this, this year, we're asking you for 4.5% pay and, raise. And happy, happy to do those things, and I just have a few more seconds left, but I just wanted to share my Naval Academy son said, you know, they used to tell us that the Naval Academy we might not have the best equipment or best uh, best resources out there, but we have the best people out there. So those kids grow up thinking that. We need to make sure we're taking care of those people, and I just really appreciate you prioritizing that. Thank you so much. My time's expired. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Davis. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And thank you um, to our witnesses, um, to Secretary um, Austin, uh, to the General, General Brown. And I want to thank you in particular for uh, your service to our country and keeping the American people safe. Um, over uh, two weeks ago, the fearless airmen of the 335th Fighter Squadron shot down uh, 63 attack drones headed for Israel. The Air Force is planning to divest an entire combat squadron of Strike Eagles next year in one of the most economically um, distressed counties in all of North Carolina. Um, if you look at the, the region, um, it rates extremely high by measurements of economically distressed. Um, my question is, uh, Mr. Secretary, <clears throat> um, Congress has um, directed the, the Department of Defense um, to modernize. However, if we can still possibly uphold our national security interests while protecting local economies as it may have a devastating impact in communities, um, how do you see the department considering then this local impact on communities? Well, with every change that we make, uh, this is something that, uh, that we certainly consider and we uh, we try to work with uh, uh, local authorities where possible to, uh, to uh, mitigate uh, the, the impact if, if, there's, if it's possible to do that. Um, I, I, I agree with you, by the way. I thank you for applauding the, the work of our, our tremendous uh, fighter pilots. They, they did extraordinary work there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and, uh, but it just goes to show you the quality of people that we have uh, in, in our ranks. I know uh, General Brown was a part of that, uh, that those decisions to, uh, to modernize and, uh, and invest in a, high, a, a different uh, type of platform. And, and Mr. Why Secretary, we let, me, speak to let me ask this question. I'm, I'm just trying to understand because it's come up now in terms of the engagement with the local community. And I'm trying to understand what level of engagement has taken place with the local community in North Carolina? Well, I can't speak for the Air Force, but I, I just know based on past experience, when we, uh, as we started to make decisions of our basing and uh, either modernization or uh, divestment, uh, we, we do engage with the local community because it, they, it, uh, it's important to us that we maintain a positive relationship with the communities that we, uh, we live uh, and uh, operate in and around. And, and so, uh, um, you know, I, I expect that the Air Force is, uh, uh, if they haven't, uh, we'll make sure they 
uh, do engage. But to your knowledge, you're not aware of personally any level of engagement with Wayne County? I'm, I'm not, because I've, I've been a bit separated from this particular topic for a number of months now. Okay. And during the time that you were engaged in this topic, were you aware of any engagement? Well, at that time, this is before the decision was made, so uh, we, we don't get ahead of us the decision to start engaging. Thank you. I understand that. Uh, let me ask this question. When we think about um, Strike Eagles in particular, the unique capability um, of this aircraft across uh, combatant commands, um, would we agree that this is a unique platform? Yes, no? Oh, I mean, it, it is, and we want the best uh, variant of the F-15 that uh, we can possibly get in our inventory, and we want one that's going to be uh, help us be decisive in the in in a future contest. With that understanding, it would appear to me too that we would be concerned about maybe um, any gaps in delivery. And I would just be on record as sharing um, that concern, any gaps in delivery, and taking any steps uh, to avoid any devastating impact when we can still uphold our national security interests. So uh, thank you so much for being before us today. Thank you for what you all continue to do for the American people. Mr. Chair, I yield back. I thank the gentleman, Chair, and I recognize the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. McLean. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, thank you all for being here today um, at this important hearing. Secretary Austin, you know um, in, recently uh, we passed a Ukraine aid supplemental. Um, it was a little dicey, a little contentious, but at the end of the day it passed. Now I think comes some of the difficult conversations, and that is accountability. Because something tells me that we'll probably ask for more in the future. So just as to try and be proactive, I would say. Section 504 states that you, as the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State Blinken, are required to report to Congress um, on a concrete strategy for U.S. support to Ukraine in their war with Russia. My question is simple, and you have 45 days to do it. I believe that report is due on June 8th. Do you believe that you will have that report by June 8th? We, we will do everything uh, within our power to meet the, meet the suspense, and we have discussed this, uh, this issue a number of times uh, in, uh, in our briefings. So, uh, so we should look forward to it on the 8th? Sure. Oh, okay. Confident on that? Again, we're going to do everything possible to make the, make the suspense. I'm not sure what that means. Are we hedging our bets? Or does the deadline matter and we'll have it to us on June 8th? Uh, that means yes, we're gonna, okay. you know, we have a sus suspense to meet, we're gonna try to meet it. So. What, what do you anticipate might be some of the delays in your trying to meet it? I don't, right now I don't see any, any delays. So we, you know, again, this, this is important. We'll make sure that, uh, that you have the information that, uh, that you've asked for. Thank, thank you. Have you begun the required consultations with Secretary Blinken on the strategy? Have I uh, conducted consultations with Secretary Blinken on a strategy? Uh, we've discussed uh, uh, the Ukrainian uh, the, the strategy for Ukraine uh, in the, uh, with the National Security uh, Council a number of times. So yes, as a part of a part of the uh, the larger group, yes. Wonderful. Can you give this committee kind of a preview on what some of those concrete achievable objectives are? Yeah, and we've been consistent on this throughout. Our goal for Ukraine is to be uh, a, to make sure Ukraine is a, uh, um, a democratic, independent, um, sovereign country with the ability to defend itself and, and deter aggression in the future. So. And you're confident we're on track. Those are achievable goals, yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, my constituents you know, have, have concerns about, about this. Um, and I hope that you'll work with this committee and our committee um, to really ensure that one, this report comes in time and it lays out an actual legitimate 
measurable strategy for the for the aid that we've given and any continued aid going forward. I think the American people need to know that. Right? You know, at the end of the day, it is their, their tax dollars. And I also think it would be much more palatable if we had these concrete objectives met in a measurable time. So I look forward to June 8th. Thank you very much. I yield back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, and to the ranking member, uh, Secretary Austin, Chairman Brown, uh, it's good to see you again. And General Brown, congratulations on a very well-deserved appointment. And I look forward to continue, continuing our work together. Uh, Chairman Brown, this year's budget request enables the U.S. to plan, train, and exercise alongside our allies and partners worldwide. Last week, a new survey from Gallup found that the United States is no longer viewed as the most influential global power in Africa, having been surpassed by China. This comes as China is Africa's biggest trading partner and continues to increase its investment in the continent. We know that the U.S. is the partner of choice for many of these countries. How does this budget allow us to re-engage with nations who are caught choosing between us and the PRC, and what more can we be doing uh, in this regard? Well, what, what, the way this budget helps us is uh, you know, how we invest in our readiness, how we uh, are able to uh, work in our exercise program, and our ability to uh, engage um, with uh, the various nations, not, not only in Africa, but around the world. Uh, and as you said, we are the, uh, uh, the nation of choice in, in, in many cases. Um, and. Uh, for those nations that share our values, we're able to work very closely with them. That's something that we've got to continue to engage and stay engaged. And this is where AFRICOM, uh, in particular, is working, having talked to General Langley on, uh, on this topic here uh, several times over the course of the past several weeks. Thank you. And Secretary Austin, how important is it to increase our competitive defense activities with our allies and our partners? And what direct be benefits will this have on our defense industrial base? How important is it to increase our activity with allies and partners? It's fundamental to our strategy, sir. I, and, uh, as you take a look at our, our defense strategy, you know, our um, strengthening our relationships with allies and partners is fundamental to that. And you've seen us do that, and not only uh, in the European theater, but also, most important, in the, uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific as well. If you take a look at the numbers of countries uh, that we strengthen our relationship with, I think it's 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 really uh, impressive, uh, and and uh, in some cases uh, we've created uh, a generational uh, capability that uh, that I think will add significant value to deterrence going forward. AUKUS is one of those one of those things that uh, I'm talking about. So. Thank you, uh, Secretary Austin. As you know, um, my district includes Creech Air Force Base, Hawthorne Army Depot, Depot, and and Nellis Air Force Base. I'm happy to see that there are investments in the construction, maintenance, and cleanup of military housing and the department's commitment to resilient and healthy defense communities. But sometimes in rural communities uh, that are often lacking basic services, including housing. So how is the department applying that commitment to rural bases in particular, like the ones in my district, to ensure that our service members and their families have the resources that they need to carry out their important missions? Well, all of our bases are important, and uh, we understand that uh, in, in many cases, uh, uh, the, the, the rural areas are, are most challenged, and, uh, and so uh, I think it's important to all of us, the service secretaries, to make sure that they're doing the right things to apportion resources so that, uh, you know, we're taking care of our troops and taking care of our families. So, um, that's a thing that will remain a priority for service secretaries and, and myself going forward, but you know, each service is a little different. So. I'll continue to bring those priorities up and appreciate your leadership. Finally, Secretary Austin, in December, Deputy Secretary Hicks tasked offices across the department with, the developing, with developing plans to implement the 17 recommendations from the internal review team on racial disparities in the investigative and military justice systems. These plans of action and milestones were due to the un Undersecretary for, un uh, excuse me, they were due uh, to the Undersecretary for Personnel and Readiness last week. The Deputy Secretary also 
initiated immediate policy changes to increase service member protections. Recently, a RAND report found that black men in the Air Force uh, junior enlisted ranks are 86% more likely than their white counterparts to face non-judicial punishment or court-martial. Secretary Austin, every day our military grows more diverse, and I believe it is critical that we support policies that ensure our forces can work as a cohesive team, and that means addressing disparities that affect our military service members, particularly those of color. So I would like to work with you on this issue and would ask that you provide an overview on the plan of action to implement the recommendation and what immediate policy changes that will be needed. Gentlemen's time service expired. member. Protection. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fallon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to address the recent crisis in our uh, recruiting, in our military. And it's heartening to see that the Marines have met the recruiting goals over the last three years in the Space Force since their inception. But unfortunately, it's not the case with the three largest branches. And uh, Chairman Brown, I would like to discuss it with you. I mean, the Air Force missed their recruiting goal by 11% in FY23. The Navy in the last two years, 20% in, 20, in uh, FY23 and 36%, which is very alarming, over a third uh, this year so far. And then the Army missed out over the last three years by 25%, 23%, and 16%. So the, uh, clearly, this is absolutely unsustainable. And would you agree that this is uh, this persistent recruiting shortfalls? These are uh, have reached crisis levels, and it's an existential threat to our republic. Uh, what I will tell you, it, it, you're right. The numbers you said aren't sustainable. But uh, as you look at the numbers for 24, um, uh, almost all the services are going to meet their goal. Um, the, the one service that's having uh, probably a bit more challenges is the Navy, but uh, they're all at 90 percent or above as far as uh, uh, to meet the goal for recruiting for, for this particular year. So I do see a positive trend line uh, based on our recruiting. You'd, you'd agree, though, General, that if this is uh, sustained, that it, we, we're in some serious trouble? Well, what, what I would tell Turn you is it around. Well, well, it, we need to stay in the path we're on okay. and continue the, the upward trend. So with specificity, what new innovative approaches are we using in recruiting to ensure that this doesn't happen? Well, part of it is that you know, we've got to be out and, and able to engage. And that's you know, because of COVID. Uh, we weren't able to get into the high schools, but it's not just into the high schools, but it's how we, uh, we do our marketing. It's how we engage with uh, um, our, our local communities. It's how we engage with the, uh, our influencers, uh, whether it's uh, you know, coaches, parents, uh, guidance counselors. To general, talk about you, the value of service. And I apologize because it's a limited time, but would you agree that if there's school systems out there that aren't allowing the military access, then they should be, uh, we should consider withholding federal funding? Well, I, I'm not going to tell you how best to do it, but I think we should have access to those schools because it, as an all-volunteer force and our service, our service members help protect their rights. So when, when I read uh, you and the Secretary's written statements and heard your testimony this, uh, earlier today, uh, there were some really neat buzzwords. Uh, most formidable fighting force in history, a strategic approach. We're going to strengthen our integrated deterrence. We're going to confront threats. We're going to fight and win. We're going to hone war fighting skills. We're going to have strategic imperatives. We're going, to have, uh, we're going to face rapidly evolving threats. We're going to defeat those threats. We're going to outpace our competitors and unparalleled combat capabilities across all domains. All these things that sound great. And then the best possible stewards of our hard-earned taxpayer dollars. We have to be those stewards. So I want to bring to your attention, uh, Secretary Austin, an article that was written by the Department of Army on June 22, 2023, in a tweet that the DOD sent out on July 2nd of last year. And it's a tweet of a biological man who's now I'm sure I would imagine being held to dress and physical fitness standards of a woman. And the quote on the tweet said, Major Rachel Jones found solace after coming out as a transgender female. Her journey from battling depression and suicidal thoughts to embracing authenticity inspires us all. So my question is, why would Major Jones have been elevated above all of the other roughly 1.4 million active duty service members and given the honor of this visible recognition and thrust out to the world as the face of the United States military on the, on the 2nd of July of last year. Was it an act of heroism? Was, it, was valor on display? Was it a commitment to world-class fitness? That doesn't look like it. Was it a tremendous achievement or elite leadership? Or was it simply that there was a biological man who wants to be a woman and wave political flags while in uniform? I'm not, I'm not familiar with Major Jones' uh, case, but I certainly uh, will, uh, will, will become so. I, uh, again, and whether or not the Major was elevated for recognition or reward over others. You well, know. the tweet, 
the secretary was just about being transgender. It wasn't uh, a, a, anything about coming up with an incredible uh, cyber security program to protect it. It was just simply that Major Jones is transgender, above all 1.4 million others. And, and so you're implying that, uh, that the major was was elevated above everyone elevated else. Elevated that, over that, other that's, troops because... If, it was, if Major Jones did something excellent, then I could care less. But it was simply a political statement. And I'm sure the communists in Beijing are quaking in their boots and now won't invade Taiwan because Rachel has authenticity. Or, heck, there could be a unilateral withdrawal by the Russians from Ukraine because Rachel's so inspiring. I mean, we got to focus more on projecting power and a hell of a lot less on projecting pronouns. I yield back. Uh, again, uh, I, I'd like to answer that. Gentlemen's time's expired. Che Chair, I recognize a gentlelady from uh, Texas. Oh, I'm sorry, the gentleman from Texas. I got the state right, <laughs> Mr. Beasy. <laughs> Mr. Beasy's recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Austin, I brought this up to you a couple of years ago, uh, but wanted to bring it back to your attention. Uh, as you know, the 80th anniversary of D-Day is about to occur. And, you know, one of the, I think one of the sad stories about D-Day and Hollywood has, has done this, and you know, the longest day did it, Steven Spielberg did it with Saving Private Ryan. The African-American soldiers of the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion have been erased from their part uh, on the beaches of uh, Omaha uh, and, and, and what happened on that day on, on June 6, 1944. And uh, Linda Hervo wrote a book called Forgotten about those soldiers uh, and talked about their, their ordeal and everything they went through, went through leading up to that day on June 6, 1944. And there was one soldier, Corporal Waverly Woodson, that uh, should have received the Medal of Honor, and he still has not received it. And I know that his, that his family would like for him to receive the Medal of Honor, and uh, Linda Hervo has done a great job of documenting and finding documents that support his claim for the Medal of Honor. And I was wondering, have you done or heard anything more about where Corporal Woodson's uh, posthumously Medal of Honor is right now? Well, first of all, let me, let me say that uh, uh, our country remains grateful for the tremendous sacrifices and service of uh, our World War II veterans. Um, in terms of this specific recommendation for Medal of Honor, I've, I've not uh, received a recommendation for Medal of Honor yet. For, yeah. yeah. How, how would someone bring that to your attention? Because this is, a, this is a big deal for this family, and I think for this country, too, because Th these soldiers of the 320th, and, and as you know, because I saw you on the History Channel talking about a plaque, I believe it was in Georgia or Alabama, that there was a, a, a group of African-American soldiers that just now got their recognition for something that they did during World War II, and, and, I, and, and you did very good in that documentary. But this particular day is, is, and, and is such a big deal in American history, uh, and we need these veterans to be recognized, and particularly this one, how would, how would we bring that and get it in front of you to make sure that it gets a thorough review, that Corporal Woodson uh, can, and his family can see him receive this Medal of Honor posthumously? Uh, for soldiers, it would, uh, the recommendation would have to be presented to the uh, Department of the Army. And if the, if the uh, Chief of Staff of the Army and, uh, and the Secretary of the Army um, concur uh, that, you know, this uh, individual meets the requirements for that award, then that recommendation would come forward to me. But Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to ask you, you know, one of the things that a lot of my re Republican colleagues, uh, mo moving on from that, one of the things that my Republican colleagues have talked a lot about is the term that they you know, call wokeism. And you've, you've been here, you've been a part of the hearings and, and heard uh, a, a lot of the things that they're bringing up. And it, it worries me about how the department is planning to address and mitigate the issues of racism, because my biggest fear is that someone hearing, you know, hey, we're going to attack wokeism, that they're going, that that is going to make black and other soldiers of color more vulnerable, and have their issues of racism and sexism taken less seriously, because it'll just be dismissed as quote unquote uh, wokeism. Um, how is the department planning to address 
uh, and mitigate uh, concerns of racism and sexism that still continue to exist to this day, some which are, are structural, uh, uh, with all of the rhetoric around sort of watering down a lot of these concerns. Uh, thank you, sir. We will do what we've always done and we continue to do, and that is make sure that leaders uh, create the right climate uh, for, for all of our troops to uh, not only be able to be effective in, but also grow and thrive in. Um, and I would remind everybody that we have the most combat credible uh, force uh, in the world, and, and, uh, and we endeavor to continue to make it better. Uh, the fact that we get uh, um, contributions from every segment in society uh, is, is a great thing. Our, our military looks like, our, looks like America, and that's what you would expect. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, people uh, in our force uh, understand that, you know, if they do the work and they, 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 uh, they meet the qualifications and they will continue to excel, continue to be promoted. Gentleman's time's expired. Chair, Thank I you. recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Alford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The increase of $7.9 billion above the FY24 defense budget to $849.8 .8 billion top line for a 25 defense budget represents a 0.9% increase in defense spending. Accounting for inflation, it's really a cut to the defense budget. And with that cut, I understand the department is faced with some tough choices. The effect of these cuts can be seen in the Navy's request for only one Virginia-class attack submarine and the Air Force's request for six fewer F-35s and 18 instead of 24 F-15EXs, among other requests for less across the DOD. I'm really concerned about the, the cap that we place on defense spending as we're trying to deter two near-peer adversaries. I also want to talk a little bit about Taiwan. I just recently got back there uh, from Taiwan meeting with the President Tsai and others. Uh, they're really concerned, as am I, about the $19 billion in the weapons backlog uh, I, I believe quite a few F-16s that need to be there by 2026, Harpoon missiles. Uh, Mr. Secretary, what are we doing to reduce this backlog? Uh, thanks, sir. Well, you, heard, you may have heard me say earlier that, uh, you know, three years ago I stood up a task force to really look at this backlog and, and figure out what the obstacles are. And this, you know, the, the FMS process is a, is a complicated process that involves uh, a lot of different moving parts. Uh, and, and that Tiger team is still in existence. Uh, it identified a number of, uh, of things that we needed to, uh, we, we could do to speed things up and where we, could, where we can, we have done those things. But my charter to them is to keep working things and keep moving uh, this uh, for, uh, forward as fast as we can. Okay, let me interrupt you. I'm sorry, sir. I know General uh, Bacon did ask about this previously, but, and I know you've got a plan, you've got somebody looking at this, but, you know, w with, with a possible invasion at 2027, and I know some generals have said that, um, and, and Xi Jinping is, is reducing his timeline. He's gone from 2035. He is ramping up aggression and coercion economically and socially. They are crossing the line in the Taiwan Straits every day now, not just once a month. But this is picking up. The storm is coming. What are we going to do to help Taiwan prepare for a, a proper defense against the communist powers of China? In accordance with the Taiwan Relations Act, uh uh, we will continue to, uh, to provide Taiwan assistance uh, to, uh, to, to, defend, uh, to help defend itself. Uh, and we've been doing that uh, over time. We remain uh, um, focused on their needs and, and getting uh, security system, assistance to them as quickly as we possibly can. And again, some of this involves industry, as you know. Right. And uh, it's easy to to say I can spin the dial and, 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 and force industry to produce something quicker, uh, not, always, uh, not always that easy. But we are committed to working with industry to make, make sure that uh, you know, we're doing everything that we can uh, to move as rapidly as possible. When we recognize that there are challenges uh, that uh, you know, a number of countries can present, um, I personally don't see a conflict with China being uh, imminent or inevitable. But, uh, but again, we have to be prepared, and, uh, and we got to make sure that uh, if something like that happens, uh, we are dominant in the battle space. 
And, and that's our goal, and that's what we're working towards every day. Well, I agree with you, sir. I think the, the best, <clears throat> of course, you're much more of an expert than I, but we've got to help in the deterrence um, and, and not let this get to a point where there is kinetic conflict. Uh, I want to skip back to Ukraine just a little bit because I know that you said, um, I forgot your exact quote about kind of defining what, um, victory looks like, that, that they end up with a democracy and a sovereign nation. But what does that mean? What does victory look back? Is it like, is it, is it taking back Crimea? Is it pre-1991 borders? We have got no clear definition of what the end game is. How much are we in this for, for our taxpayers? How long will this last? And it's really hard to sell com, uh, continuing supplemental packages to the folks back home in the Missouri's 4th Congressional District when we get no clear definition. Well, again, um, we, we do want to see Ukraine um, as a, a democracy, that's independent and a sovereign nation, and, and again, with the ability to defend itself and deter aggression in the future. And we are doing things to, uh, to, to help them build right. that case. I'm sorry, we're out of time. I appreciate your answer, but it does not answer the question of what does victory look like. America deserves Gentleman's an time's answer. time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the three gentlemen who are here uh, so for so long in testifying, I appreciate uh, your being here today. Um, Secretary Austin, I want to thank you uh, for your focus on naval innovation. Uh, on one hand, we've demonstrated how investing early in innovative technology enables us to deter advanced threats through our successful operations in the Red Sea. On the other hand, though, Ukraine can demonstrate our lack of flexibility in being able to support rapid innovation. This is why I believe, and I hope you believe, why we need naval-focused innovation, especially at a center that offers efficient, effective, and economical solutions for both today's battles and tomorrow's conflicts. Innovation is deterrence, and I'm glad to be working with Secretary uh, Navy Secretary Del Toro on the Naval Innovation Center at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, of course, in the 19th Congressional District. This center will leverage the private sector and DOD innovation hubs by merging them with the MPS's students to address strategic competition and in regular warfare in a collaborate, collaborative and classified setting. I look forward to working together on the NIC with you in coming years to provide an innovation, in innovative solutions quickly and at scale. Now, moving on, and keep, but keeping focus on providing solutions at speed, I'm concerned about the recent developments in the Sahel, a region that I've termed and I've heard termed before as the deja coups. Understandably, considering there's been eight military takeovers since 2020 in a, basically an area that really is a hotbed of terrorism. It is becoming a danger to the United States. I said in a recent hearing when General Langley, Langley sat right where you were at, that we are at an inflection point when it comes to the Sahel. We're either gonna double down or we fold. Right now, it looks like we're going to be folding, but we're at a stand standstill and we're trying to figure out how we can play that next hand, understandably so. We saw in Niger that we're drafting plans to withdraw about 1,000 U.S. troops after failed attempts to revise our military agreements. It's not just a trend of Niger's military junta kicking out U.S. partners, including France and the EU. Now we're seeing about 100 Russia soldiers sweeping in for security training, and then there's just recent reports about this anti-aircraft uh, device that they're bringing in as well. The situation in Chad just looks just as bad. As we heard on April 25th, they received, we received notice that the Pentagon would withdraw about 75 Army Special Forces. Like Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, there are reports that Russia is growing its foothold in Chad as well. What we're seeing in this area is a trend. Pushes take control. They oust Western security partners, they invite Russians in, and there's a resurgence of VEOs and terrorist attacks. It literally is becoming one of the most dangerous stretches of territory in the world. That is why last year I worked with Representative Scott to designate Chad, Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso as qualified hazardous duty areas to grant our service members stationed there so that they can get tax exclusion benefits in recognition of the threats that they confront. We want to be clear that the threats in West Africa, in the Sahel, pose a risk to U.S. service members and, yes, to the United States of America. So, Secretary Austin, 
Can you tell us what our strategy is, what our plan is? In the short term, are we just going to withdraw to protect the littoral states in West Africa? Or in the long term, how much of a gap are we going to have to leave in time and in space to where we're going to start to call the Sahel a caliphate? Thank you, sir. We know that terrorism thrives in ungoverned spaces. And for that reason, our approach uh, throughout has been to uh, help countries develop uh, a capability to, uh, go, uh, to defend their, their, uh, their, their territory, and, uh, and, and that will, in, that will uh, decrease uh, the ability for terrorists to operate in those spaces and, and, and export, uh, export terror. Uh, in order to do that, though, we have to have uh, a, uh, a reliable partner. Uh, now, you know, following the coup in 23, uh, in 23, um, the coup in Niger. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, we've been encouraging uh, the junta to conduct uh, fair, uh, free and fair elections, like they, they said they were going to do early on. They're, they've not done that, and don't, have no uh, intent on doing that, as far as we can tell. And and so. Um, if we don't have a reliable partner to work with, then it's very difficult to, for us to, uh, to do the work that we know it needs to be. We will always lead with our values. Agree with you. I'm going to be out of time. I just hope that we can continue to talk about a strategy for that area. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Recently, we had the Supreme Allied Commander here, and I asked him straight up, can we win in Ukraine? And he said, yes, without hesitation. Now, we have a lot of disagreement inside of our party. Matter of fact, even people sitting next to each other can disagree on how we handle Ukraine. But one thing we'd probably all agree is if we promise somebody something, that we should probably get them in a timely manner if we're going to have any chance at all. And one of the things I have a big problem with is we keep on saying we're going to give people stuff, but we slow roll it. The most assured way to extend this war is to make sure that they don't get the weapons in a timely manner, uh, whether it be... Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, or what we're doing in Ukraine right now, the only time we ever were able to be effective as the leading world power was Sir Jobs. If we have a country with a $200 billion GDP going to country, against a country with a $2 trillion GDP with a much larger and modern army, we can't expect them to actually hold out or do any good damage unless we supply them the things we promised them. It took us a long time to get them the tanks that we promised, the ammunition we promised, and other things we promised, not to mention Taiwan. They paid for stuff we still haven't given them. And then we had to do another package, but we haven't, I don't know when that's gonna get there. My concern is that we're not delivering the things we promise people in order to be effective in what our strategy is as global leaders. Um, with that said, Secretary Austin, what are we doing to streamline that process to get the deliverables to those people who need it as strategic allies? Well, certainly we, we are working uh, uh, hard to uh, ensure that we rapidly deliver security assistance to, to Ukraine, and I want to thank the uh, Congress for, for your support of the supplemental. It took us a while to get that across the, across the goal line, but that, you, can't, you can't provide the security assistance without the resources. Um, if you uh, look at uh, Israel, uh, we moved uh, heaven and earth to get uh, capability to I, I want to be very specific because we're time limited. What are we doing specifically to get the weapons to Taiwan and Ukraine that we've been slow rolling so far? Well, you may have heard me say earlier in terms of the FMS backlog for, for Taiwan that, uh, you know, early on I set up a Tiger team to look at this and, and work through these issues, work through the obstacles, uh, and, then, and they've been doing that. They've identified some, uh, some ways to, uh, to speed some things up, but it's a, a complex uh, um, process and it involves a lot of inputs. Uh, industry is uh, is is a big player in this, and as, as much as we may want it, uh, unless industry can produce it in a timely fashion, uh, you can't get it. So, and I know that's all that's all uh, obvious to you, but but uh, you know we will re remain focused on this, and it's important to all of us that uh, we get Taiwan uh, what it's uh, what it's uh, asked for and what it's paid for, so that uh, we can. Uh, they can defend themselves. Okay, I've heard you talking about Israel, and I've heard you talk about Taiwan, specifically in Ukraine. You're talking about a country who, who right now is losing grounds, who's being outshilled 10 to 1. Uh, we've seen this coming. It's not like it's a surprise. Like, like, we haven't 
been at war now for a couple of years. Uh, and what concerns me is we have a combined European and, and United States GDP of about $47 trillion. We're going against a country that has a GDP of $2 trillion, and yet we're getting outgunned 10 to 1. I find that extremely alarming to me if we're going to be good stewards of the assets we have, that we cannot deliver what it takes to win a conflict that we say that we're committed to. Whether we agree on that or not, the worst possible scenario is happening right now. Two years. Two years, we've seen this coming. We've committed to, we voted unanimously in NATO to support this country. Whether we like it or not, as a divided Congress, we committed to it, we funded it, and yet we don't do our job to deliver quickly. We need to aggressive. It can't be platitudes where we're reviewing, blah, blah, blah. It's hard. I mean, we need feedback on what we can do to radically change this process to deliver what we need to in order to win this conflict, or else this country will be forever changed and we'll lose a top five country in resources who produces 70% of the European grain in a time where we're going to have double the need for food around the world in the next, 50, in the next 25 years. You, you know, have the quite, food poor, and you have the food poor nations of Iran. It is Iran. quite remarkable that a country that is, uh, has the capability that Ukraine had at the beginning of this fight, facing the most powerful military in Europe, has been able to fight and hold off uh, uh, the Russians uh, for two years. The only way that they can do that is with, with our help and the help of allies and partners. I hope we can streamline that process because I'm very worried right now we're losing ground because we haven't done our part. Thank you. With that, I yield. Chair now recognizes a gentlelady from Texas. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for your service. Uh, thank you for being here today with our committee. Uh, I, I just have to say as a footnote to the, the prior conversation, it's incredible to me that um, there are concerns being expressed about getting aid to Ukraine quickly enough after six months of delay by the Republican Speaker of the House to getting this aid package to the floor so that Congress could vote on it. So I just, I felt like I had to say that um, before I get into my own questions, just as a way to make sure we remember why there was a significant delay recently. Um, Secretary Austin, I want to thank you and, and express to you my appreciation for your commitment to eradicating the scourge of sexual harassment and sexual assault in the military, and would very much like to hear from you uh, an update on the standing up of OSTCs across the services, and if you could also share with me any information on the path forward to ensuring that all OSTCs will be prepared to include sexual harassment cases by the January 1st, 2025 start date. Well, well, thank you, and let me thank uh, Congress for your support of uh, the significant changes to the UCMJ that we made uh, that, uh, that I believe will provide uh, uh, better results for, for the force going forward and our, our ability to tackle this uh, really important uh, issue. And it's an issue, that, as you know, that I took on from the very first day that I came in office. Um, all of the OSTPs are, are, are stood up and functioning uh, in the services, uh, and, uh, and again, um, there, there are referrals being made. One, one case has already gone to, gone to trial, and, and so we don't have a, a significant uh, uh, amount of data to assess uh, at this point, but we have the framework to be able to assess uh, whether or not, uh, you know, we're, we're moving in the right direction or not. You know, our, our legal uh, uh, department is, is really, uh, has really done the right things in outlining that framework, and, and so I think we'll, be, we'll continue to be uh, in a good place here. Uh, but uh, our leaders are, are invested in this, from the secretaries on down to the, uh, the chiefs of defense, uh, but the chief of defense here, the, 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 uh, the chairman, and, uh, and also the, the service chiefs as well. So a uh, lot more work uh, to be done yet, but uh, but I think we're off to a good start, and, and, and certainly we continue to ask you for uh, the funds to support our efforts, uh, and, and we, we do so in this budget. Uh, and I want to thank you for, for what you've done thus far. Appreciate that so much. I do think at some point soon, um, at, at one of our hearings in the future, it would be great to have an update once that data is um, 
available so that so that we can uh, be able to to plan going forward and understand where we have been successful and where uh, maybe we have not been as successful. I, I want to switch gears a little bit for the the uh, latter part of my questioning and want to focus on what's happening with the Gaza temporary pier and you know, just share, I think, publicly how proud I am of the United States for everything that we are doing to try to get humanitarian aid to um, uh, people who are starving uh, in the Gaza Strip. And I absolutely understand why the effort is um, being stood up in order to, to use a, a temporary pier. But I am significantly concerned about the safety and the security of our women and men who are assisting. I am significantly concerned about the aid workers that will be asked to execute the mission. And I am very concerned about the way Israel might engage during the um, that process. And so would like for you to share with us as much as you can about safeguards that are being put in place for our personnel. Um, this is a thing that uh, Chairman and I uh, engaged General Carrillo on uh, very recently here and, and throughout, quite frankly, since the beginning of this. Uh, and uh, based upon uh, the measures that he has put in place and what he's laid out, uh, I'm confident that uh, our, our troops will be able to protect themselves. Uh, as you know, we briefed uh, before that the Israelis are also going to uh, provide uh, assistance, providing force protection uh, for our troops in the area. And we'll have uh, assets in the area uh, beyond that. Generally, time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Secretary Austin, I want to first start out by saying I'm relieved to hear that the diagnosis in your health is improved. and. Uh, we hope that it continues to do the same, so uh, that's really good to hear. Uh, as one of my colleagues, Mr. Panetta, had pointed out, the Sahel area has had eight coups since 2020. Is that correct? There have been a number there, yes. Can you tell me who is president since 2020? I'm sorry? Who has been president of the United States since 2020? Of course, President Biden uh, was okay. inaugurated. And I want to go into Iraq for a moment. The amount of Iranian missiles and rockets that's been fired has been vastly increased between 2021 and 2024. Would you agree? Over 159 plus attacks? There have been a number of attacks. The vast majority of those attacks have been ineffective. And can you tell me who was president during this time? Of course, it was President Biden. In but I, what I would also tell you one is, second, that, sir. is that in, in uh, 2019, we were able to put 18 historic peace treaties in place called the Abram Accords. Do you agree that given the fact that it wasn't since 1979 for Egypt, 1994 for Jordan to normalize relations with Israel, that this was a very good step towards helping with the stabilization of the Middle East? I, I do agree with that. And can you tell me who put that in place? It was a previous administration, obviously. Can you tell me who that was exactly, Mr. Secretary? I didn't think so. Um, and under the attacks that took place on October 7th of 2023 that resulted in over 1,200 innocent men, women, and children being slaughtered, being raped, being taken hostage, et cetera. Can you tell me who was president at that time? Of course, it's President Biden. In 2016 and 2020, we recognized that 12% of global trade goes through the Red Sea. And in an effort to try and ensure the safety and security of trade and commerce, which would allow us to keep our goods down, there was a designation uh, as a terrorist organization of the Houthis. Can you tell me who put that designation in place, sir? It was the previous administration. And can you tell me who removed that designation, sir? Of course, it was removed uh, by this administration. And can you tell me whether or not, just a, a simple yes or no, that we've seen an increase in disruption and attacks in the Red Sea under this administration? 
We have seen uh, increased violence. Thank you so much, sir. And can you also tell me who was in office in 2014 when Russians came across in Donetsk and also in Lugansk in Ukraine? <clears throat> President Obama. And can you tell me who was the vice president at the time? President Biden. And can you tell me then, in the ramp up to the war where things have continued to escalate vastly, and I think that you have been great at continuing to give us the facts on how Russia is advancing, what the major threats are, how Ukraine is being pushed out with the necessary funding, as you've pointed out numerous times, can you tell me at what point you saw the war ramping up from Russia and their attacks? This is prior to the attack or, or No, no, no. Recently? Can you tell me when you saw the greatest uh, ad advancement uh, in what year exactly? Six months ago. Okay. Uh, you know, and, and who was and, the and president at the time? If we, if we had the ability to... Uh, to my, my point in trying to understand this, Mr. Secretary, is that we have pointed out numerous times, as my previous colleagues said, that we are not safer now under this administration than we were previously, which is a contrary statement to what you've said, as I've just outlined. And not to mention the fact that your predecessors, let's just say in the Democrat administration, Secretary Robert Gates, he also made a comment that said, I think he has been wrong on nearly every major foreign policy and national security issue over the past four decades. Can you tell me who he was referencing in that comment? I believe Secretary Gates was uh, referring can you, can to, you just please tell me who he to was referencing? President Biden. President Biden. But, but so what point, we established here is that we are not safer under earlier President Biden that, than we were under President Trump. What we are establishing is that the Abram Accords was put in place under President Trump to help and that the things that are occurring in Ukraine, in the Sahel, in Israel, in Afghanistan with the Bosch withdrawal would not have happened under President Trump. Gentlemen's time it has expired. all happened under Chair President Biden. Chair, I recognize this General Lee from Alabama. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome to our committee uh, hearing, uh, Secretary Austin and General Brown. Um, Secretary Austin, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to um, my um, colleagues' uh, comments. Yeah, just just to make just to make the point that that you know, um, the point that I made earlier was that uh, without our leadership, without our uh, our, our engagement. Uh, the condition in Europe would be a heck of a lot worse. Uh, Putin would own uh, Ukraine, and uh, and and Europe would be uh, in a much much worse place. And of course, what we've done in the in the Middle East uh, as a result uh, in the aftermath of this uh, invasion or or attack by the by the uh, by Hamas is to work to ensure that uh, Israel has had the means to. Uh, to defend itself, and at the same time, we were doing what's necessary to protect uh, our troops and civilians in the area, and, and also contain this uh, this this conflict and prevent it from uh, uh, becoming a regional conflict. Thank and, you, and, sir. And, okay. Yeah. Um, General Brown, first of all, congratulations on your confirmations. Uh, you've been confirmed since the last time you were before us. Um, you know, I'm worried about the growing ties between Russia and uh, North Korea and Iran and really want to understand um, what we're doing to strengthen our allies and our partnerships uh, around the world in order to deal with that threat. Well, as I uh, said earlier, um, as we look at these, uh, these particular threats, uh, as the world's got more complex, uh, what I found is that uh, we've been able to engage more and more with our allies and partners. Uh, I've been in this job for seven months. I've engaged about 170 times with my counterparts uh, as, uh, as most recent as yesterday. And uh, it's that dialogue of how we work together. I've watched how European nations have uh, foc not only focused on what's going on in Europe, but they're also focused on, on the Indo-Pacific and other parts of the world. And I would say the same thing about the Indo-Pacific nations focused on what's going on in Europe. What do you see as our biggest threat? Well, our, you know, our, our biggest threat is that we uh, don't lead. I mean, one of the things that uh, U.S. leadership is uh, highly desired, it's watched, and that's the feedback you get when I engage with our counterparts. And so we've got to be able to lead um, and you know, appreciate what the uh, Congress was able to do with this supplemental. Because once we've done that, I've had, in the course of the past week, I've engaged with a number of my uh, counterparts, and they've all appreciated the fact, uh, to, you know, Ukraine in particular, the fact that uh, U.S. leadership to, to move forward. So we've got to continue to work together. Uh, to uh, address all these threats, and uh, that's the way we'll be successful 
uh, for not only for our national security, but for global security as well. Well, thank you, sir. You know, um, I think another way we lead uh, is making sure that our military reflects the beautiful diversity that is uh, America. Um, when I, uh, when aspiring for leadership roles, I think you have to sometimes see it to know that you uh, could be it. Um, and we know that you have to, uh, that, that as black soldiers look at the fact that we have both an African-American Secretary of Defense, the first one, and the second, um, the second chairman of the Joint Chiefs, um, I think that uh, they envision themselves in those roles, and that's a good thing. Um, Secretary Austin, can you talk about why it's important to create a diverse pipeline when you think about um, uh, the military and, and, and our role globally in the world? Well, our, our military, thank you, our military should reflect our country. We, we have a diverse country, and our military uh, currently reflects that. It will continue to reflect that. Uh, and we, so we want, uh, we want talent from every corner of the country. Uh, and as we acquire that talent, we want our troops to know that uh, if, they, if they are qualified, if they do the work, uh, they can be successful. There's a path for them to be successful and climb as far as, uh, as, they, as, they, as they want to climb. And, and that's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you, you succeed in the military based on merit. Uh, it's been that way in the past. It is that way today. It will be that way in the future. So. Uh, General Brown, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I'd uh, also uh, echo what you said. You know, I often say young people only aspire to be what they see. And uh, I just feel, uh, you know, privileged to, to have this opportunity to sit here as a chairman and sit next to uh, Secretary Austin uh, to be role models, not just for African Americans, but for all that, you know, we want to provide an opportunity for everyone that joins our military uh, to serve uh, as a uh, DOD civilian to reach your full potential. Absolutely. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentlelady chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gooden. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I know you've been asked a few times. I just wanted to elaborate on the, uh, the Gaza Pier construction that's going on. Um, so if we had U.S. service members uh, that were attacked, is there a, a, a procedure in place? Do the Israelis respond first, or are we going to defend ourselves first? Has that been discussed that you could share? Well, it, it depends on... on where the attack came from and the, the nature of the attack. Uh, you know, I, I would continue to highlight that uh, our troops always have the inherent right to protect themselves. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as we've stated before, the Israelis are assistant, assisting in, the, uh, uh, in providing uh, uh, security uh, near, the, near the shore. Uh, and so, uh, and I've talked uh, with the Minister of Defense, Israeli Minister of Defense, on this a couple of times, and he assures me that they will uh, do everything possible to protect our troops. But we can protect ourselves. We've, all, we've also talked with uh, General Carrillo, the combatant commander, uh, and he outlined in detail all of the additional measures he's putting in place to ensure that, that we protect our troops. And I am comfortable uh, with, uh, with what he's outlined, and, and, uh, and again, uh, you can't I mean, there are a number of things that can happen, uh, but no matter what happens, I think we'll be uh, in the best position to, to take care of our troops and defend ourselves. This is really important to me and the chairman. So. And would you agree then um, that we're still moving toward that goal that the president stated in the State of Union that we would not have boots on the ground there? We, we, will, we will have no, no American troops on the, on the ground in Gaza. Right. Thank you. Um, continuing with that region and Gaza, et cetera, um, would you have any comment on the role that the Qataris have played? Uh, it's my view that they've been pretty helpful uh, through this proje uh, process, and that our air base there in Qatar is essential uh, to our operations in the Middle East. Um, the, the Qataris have been uh, very helpful, and, and they are, to, to this day as we speak, they are instrumental in, in trying to uh, uh, negotiate uh, a... Uh, a, a, uh, an agreement uh, that calls for ceasefire, return of hostages, and so uh, they've been enormously helpful there. And you're right, uh, we have a significant capability there in, in Qatar in terms of the air base that we have there. Uh, and they've been uh, uh, really, really uh, generous in, 
in providing uh, access to us and, and resources for us. And General Brown and I have both served there in, in formal lives. And, uh, and again, uh, they've been great partners, and I think they'll continue to be uh, going forward. Thank you. That was my impression. I was happy to hear you reiterate it. Thank you. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. And with that, I believe all the members uh, have been accommodated, and I appreciate your uh, patience and presence. And uh, Under Secretary McCord, you had a good day. <laughs> I appreciate you very much. Does the ranking member have any closing statements? If not, apparently not. We are adjourned. <laughs>